In this video, we're going to talk about Betrayed by Hell, Unleashed on Earth, and the humanity and horror of Spawn. All right, my brothers and my sisters from another mister. This is a comic book review of Spawn, issues number 1 through 25. This is kind of like the part one of the Spawn compendium trade paperback where instead of putting off 50 issues, I'm going to break it down into two parts. So we're going to do issues number one through 25 of Spawn brought to you by Rated Comics. Now, before we get into the content, link in description if you wish to add any of these comic books to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. Also, don't forget to check out RatedComics.com if you want to check out our limited print rated comic exclusives to add to your comic book collection as well timestamps will be in the description if you wish to go from issue to issue not to mention there's gonna be a long video so if you can handle this in one sitting get your popcorn ready get your drink ready get your soda pop ready and enjoy but if you have to come back to it hey i understand because it's a lot of spawn content to cover over this channel all right but with all that being said hey let's get into the content We begin this issue with Al Simmons narrating that he doesn't belong here. Not here, not now. The deal he made was rigged. He made me believe, he says. Now there's darkness in my soul. He wants to die again, but he chose to come back. Does he mean it? Does he not mean it? At this point, I don't even think he knows the answer to that. But what he does know is he chose to come back, but he doesn't know why. His memory starts to come back in fragments. We know that's Wanda, but at the time he doesn't know that. He remembers someone to hate. That's Jason Wynn, but he doesn't know that at the time. Al remembers being something special and proud of it, United States military. Now he also remembers dying. All these things start to come together in fragmented pieces and in gaps. To Simmons, it's not making sense. It's clear when he states that I needed, he gave, I had to, and all that I could think of was her. We know that he made a deal with Malboja to see Wanda again. But what he wasn't expecting was the lies, the plot twist. He accepted the deal on his terms, his rules, and his way, and somewhere in time Malboja is laughing his ass off about it. At this point when this came out, it wasn't known that Malboja was the demon he made a deal with. But we know now. We know that Spawn's power meter at the release of this issue is 9999, 9999. As much power as he was given, he was also robbed of his memories. He knows he has to find Wanda so he can piece this thing together, but he can't remember her. But Spawn is certain that she'll remember him. He's going to find her all right, and when he finds her, he'll have his answers. Then he's going to find the one who framed him. Every story has a beginning, and this is Al Simmons, aka Spawn's beginning. And in this panel, we are introduced to Sam and Twitch, NYPD homicide detectives. They're investigating who threw Carlo Giamatti from a window, a mobster. He was thrown from the 44th floor. To add a humorous plot twist to this thing, Carlo Giamatti's heart was removed. I mean, maybe getting thrown out of 44 stories from above is not enough. Your heart's gotta be removed too for good measure, you know what I mean? A little dark humor, and speaking of dark humor, Sam believes they got themselves a grade A wacker or the best damn volunteer cop in New York City. He feels that way because three hitmen were found dead in the last 48 hours. He sees it as somebody is saving him a lot of work. Now, in this panel, Spawn stops a group of thugs trying to thug themselves into this woman in the alleyway. Not to mention, they want to cut her tongue out too. Spawn takes the leader and tosses his ass out the window. You ain't carving no tongue, son. And tell your mama to save me a plate. All this memory mind messing with me is making the hell Spawn hungry. <laughs> Alright. Spawn asks the other boys, who's next? One of the thugs step up to Spawn like, bruh, nobody messes with me. Spawn flashes his necroplasm and tells him, Fat boy, you're way out of your league. And why do I get the voice of Keith David, the original Spawn voice in the animated series? Just That just kicked in right at this point. He lets out a small dot of necroplasm and we got ourselves a necroplasm explosion. He turns to the lady and tells her not to be afraid. Naturally afraid, she tells him, Please, I'll do whatever you want. Before he can assure her that it's all good, the random inconvenient memory flashback hits him again. And this time from reading it, it's not Spawn who's doing the narrating or Al Simmons, it's someone else. Something mysterious is doing the narration. Once again, your mind explodes with a searing pain. A floodgate of memory bursts wide open. Yet, it is her face that keeps haunting you. Always her face. Who is she? Then things begin to crystallize. You remember your funeral, begging and pleading for someone to release you from the darkness? You're not dead, you can't be. Then you feel her presence, warm, caring, soothing, but somewhere deep inside, she feels empty now. 
She has no reason, no meaning, no soul. But your soul lives while hers is dying. And then this demon flashes in front of his face. And this traumatizes Spawn. At first, Spawn was the one saving her. Now the victim is the one consoling Spawn. Like, hey, come and it's okay. You're all right. It's all over now. I don't know, man. That's just kind of fresh and a little bit of twist right there. So with that recent memory flashback, Spawn realizes that that's his wife. He has a wife, but he can't remember anything else. He doesn't know where her name is or the color of her eyes, but all he knows is that they were husband and wife. That's why she was grieving at the funeral. It was her that made him want to come back. And he let his mercenary instincts take over too quickly. He got too caught up in this damn costume. He's no hero. It's just that everything is so different. What happened in the last five years? He's stranded here not knowing what's going on. He knows he's alive, but he can't feel it. The only thing he feels is this damn costume and he has to get away from it and rip the symbiote mask off of him. And when he rips the symbiote mask off of him, his face just felt like he doesn't know who he is, what or what is he? And he asked himself that. Just like Sam and Twitch ask himself, who are they dealing with with this person that can rip hearts out of people's bodies? Because that freaking strength is freaking unreal. And we get to see Spawn's power meter at 995 because that little necroplasm blast reduces his power by four. So Malboja somewhere in time is just laughing his butt off. <laughs> ha, Simmons. If you think you got problems now, I promise your troubles have just begun. And that is the end of Spawn issue number one. Hey, I had to go classic with it because you know what? I realized there's some amazing Spawn story arcs that I wanted to cover. And Spawn issue number one, the beginnings, I want to cover that story arc. And if there's any other story arcs of Spawn you guys want to see me cover, comment below, let me know. Or hey, if some of you Spawn fanatics want to, did I just say Spawn fanatics? <laughs> yeah, I did. So if some of you Spawn fanatics, fanatics want me to cover the entire spawn series go, start from one and go all the way up to current a hey, by the way just comment below let me know give me some time and i pray that i can live that long to make that happen that'll be awesome but in the meantime we do have spawn issue number 296 all the way up to its current spawn volume up and running all the king spawn all the gunslinger spawn and all the scorch as well and don't forget to check out ratedcomics.com for some amazing comic books as well as rated comics exclusives to add to your comic book collection we begin this issue with the three foot tall or something like that clown standing in the alley discussing all the gruesome ways he can kill someone to a regular alley cat. Meow. <laughs> He's talking about ripping hearts out, making fillets out of someone's lungs, and making a milkshake out of this somebody's heart and soft boiling his eyes. Why? Because the clown claims to be the violator to the cat and that he will be going after Spawn later that night. He loves being him. He loves being himself but he will hate to be him tonight. And by that, he's referring to Spawn. Spawn is drawn to the top of a church cross. He begins wondering how he'll find his wife and how she'll accept him now that he's been disfigured. He doesn't know how it was done, but he does know at least why it was done. It was for her. It was to see her again. But he doesn't remember her name. For two days, he's been trying to make sense of all this. Simmons, now Spawn, has no name, no money, and no home. So he hid. He knows he's not human anymore, and he asks why his wife would want him back if he finds her again. We definitely get to know the inner turmoils of Spawn in this issue and what he's dealing with from an emotional standpoint. He curses at the devil for betraying him in his deal to come back and he knows that he's messing with him. He knows he's controlling when he gets these visions and thinks it's a sick twisted game to him. Whoever is causing Spawn to see these visions, it's all but a joke. His thoughts are interrupted when he spots that strange clown, the Violator, waving at him from the shadows of a nearby rooftop. The clown disappears into the shadows. In this panel right here, we are shown a mob boss being attacked and his bodyguard rushes to his rescue. This takes place inside the Dawn Court building. The mobsters are attacked and have their hearts ripped out from their chest. The Violator stands over a bloody mess. You know the Violator enjoys this a little too much. On top of the church, Spawn is hoping these new powers can help him find his wife again. He also wonders why did he get all these powers when all he wanted was to see her. I mean, what's the point? I just want to see my wife again. Why do I get powers as well? Then he asks himself, why would she want to hold him and see him if he looks like a rotting corpse? So Spawn attempts to use his magic to transform his skin back to the way it was before he died. He's shocked to find out that he turns himself into a white man when he knows he should be African American. In this panel right here, Sam and Twitch discuss the paperwork piling up on their desk. 
They now have six cases from the heart surgeon and no leads, all the hearts being ripped out. Sam also mentions to Twitch that they got a problem of some costume freak hiding in the alleyways. He's referring to Spawn. With all this work they got in front of them, that means no eating and no sleeping for a few days until they get some answers. We go back to the Violator again, and this time he takes out a mob boss named Gino. We get to see the Violator's dark humor in this panel, and he tells the mob boss, here's the deal, you lend me a small piece of your anatomy, and I'll let your soul get tortured forever, so guess what's next? He shudders when Gino mutters her name, Jesus, over and over again, and rips out his heart instead. You can say it was a bad guess according to the Violator. Now back to Spawn and the cruel joke that's being played on him in this panel. All he wanted to do was use his powers to be transformed to the way he was before, African American that is. He questions what did he do to deserve all this. All he wants to do is to see his wife. He knows she won't even know who he is. He believes this to be some kind of war and if it is, he wants to be taken and or ended. Then in a small whisper, he asks God if he's going crazy. Suddenly, his mind explodes as if to be on cue. Spawn receives a flashback of Jason Wynn, who had taught him the fight. He recalls getting into more fights and disagreeing with Wynn's ideals. He found that Wynn was slowly becoming evil. Liberties were being taken, rules were being broken, all in the name of democracy, freedom. The prize prey was seeing innocent people whose choices were taken away from them. America became a bully. Spawn becomes faint from the shock and exhausted. He falls into a nearby alley, and his power meter is reduced from prior events. We go back to the Violator ripping up some more hearts out of people's chests, but he's getting bored by all this. So back to Spawn, upon waking up, he finds the clown and recognizes him from the rooftop. The clown tells him that he is Spawn and a hell spawn that was sent back to Earth. And you gotta love when they get when we get a little bit of information, but we also have to reserve more information for the next issue. He asks Clown how he knows about him. He thought it was because of God. Clown doesn't like the G word because the word hurts his ears. Just like the cat in the alleyway in the beginning of this issue, the Violator flexes the many different ways he can kill Spawn and he holds nothing back from the imagination. Ripping toenails from his feet, spine ripping, snapping bones like brittle chunks, and many other forms of brutal and grotesque violence. Shaking it off, Spawn dismisses the clown and walks away. Upon turning his back, the clown reveals his true form of being the violator and ask him not to turn away and to have a heart. And that's where we end this issue with Spawn, issue number two. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know. I think I'm taking it back old school. I'm covering up the, the Spawn beginning story arc issues number one through five. And I thought I'd take it back old school so we could go back forward by learning a little bit of the past. Link in description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. We begin this issue where Spawn suddenly recalls his ex-wife's name, Wanda Blake. He's glad that he remembers his wife's name because after five years of his life missing with no memory, he was about to go cray cray. Even though we left off with the last issue of the Violator about to attack Spawn, at least that's what it seems like when his last words were, have a heart? Al recalls his encounter with him from last night. Spawn was so certain that he had the knowledge of him because he felt there was something familiar about him because Clown approaching Spawn and Spawn felt like there was something familiar about him so okay I think you're cool. Now but at the same token Spawn felt like Clown was a pain in his ass. Little did he know that was just the surface of it. After going back and forth talking to himself he decides to go see where Wanda lives. He decides to head to the Central Intelligence Agency headquarters to dig up Wanda's file to find her. Now he also thinks about how he used to think it was an invasion of privacy, but now he wants his old life back. So you know what, when it suits to his benefit, it's all good. But before when he was involved, hey, we're invading everyone's privacy. But for his sake, he needs a little bit of invasion of privacy to make it happen. Once Al finds where Wanda lives, he's going to find the scumbag who's messing with his so-called life. For someone who didn't believe in religion, he sure got thrown into a biblical nightmare. It was a hell of a deal he made to see his wife again, to be stripped away of everything, stripped of his face, stripped of his skin, and his memories. Not to mention the selective recall that Malboja decides to give Al at Malboja's will, and at Al Simmons' inconvenience as well. Elsewhere, Malboja laughs as he watches from his throne. He continues his plot to expand his army and use Spawn to aid in gathering the requisite soldiers. He's glad he has several other followers to check on him as no one from hell truly trusts each other. I mean, why would they, right? 
It wasn't by accident that Al was picked to receive the power. His life, his history made him the perfect choice. That was touched on in Spawn issue 175, which we did do a review on, link in description by the way. Feel free to check it out after you watch this video. By the way, if this is your first time here, if you're liking the content so far, you know what to do. Don't be shy, don't be stingy. Like and subscribe to this channel because we do awesome comic book reviews, especially Spawn and the occasional comic book giveaway, not to mention some comic book related content too. And link in description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection. Support the art and support the industry. But now in this panel right here, we got to go back into the content now. Sam Burke and Twitch Williams pour over the casework they have been piling up on the mob heart surgeon killings. That's what they're calling this kill, the mob heart surgeon. Courtesy of the violator, of course. It's a lot of exposition here, but we're going to sum it up for you. Why? because we got you like that. We got you here at Rated Comics. Speaking of Rated Comics, don't forget to check out our website, RatedComics.com, for some amazing Rated Comics exclusive covers and other comic books as well. Outside, the Violet prowls the alleyways, singing songs to himself about murder. It is in his singing that he states, if he doesn't kill you today, he'll try it later. Perhaps that might be the reason he didn't do anything to spawn in the previous issue. At the Central Intelligence Agency headquarters, Spawn breaks in to find Billy Miller sexually harassing his secretary Linda, who is already married. He went to the CIA to find out about Wanda and where she lives. Instead, he came across a brother trying to function in the wrong kind of way. Spawn picks him up by the throat and warns him to keep it in his pants. And could you imagine just Keith David doing the Spawn voice in that tone? Anyways, you gotta watch the animated series for that. And all Billy Miller could do at this point is like, but, but Spawn, but, 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 but please don't do nothing. Spawn isn't trying to hear all that. He takes the file on Wanda Blake and retreats into the night. Malboja laughs as Spawn uses violence, which he loves and yearns for, because the more violent Spawn gets, the more power he gets, and the more power he gets, which leads him to the likelihood of him leading Malboja's army. On the rooftops, Spawn reads about Wanda Blake, how she started a school funding in his name to help underprivileged children and maps the information to her current location, which is Queens, New York. He wonders why she would move to Queens, New York instead of living with her parents who live on Staten Island. He has another unexpected interruption, probably courtesy of Malboja, we have to assume. Outside of Wanda's house, Spawn uses his necroplasm energy to transform himself into the Caucasian once more, also draining his power meter while doing so. He rings the bell and when she opens the door, he is beside himself with how beautiful she is. When a small child named Cyan comes to the door, he faints. Upon waking up, he finds Wanda has been married to Terry Fitzgerald, his friend, and together they had a child, Cyan. Al and Terry go way back like chiropract. He is belittled and he feels like this aw piffity moment like what the hell was I doing here as he could not have children with Wanda and now understands the devil is playing with him showing him that his wife has moved on, remarried and had children or a child in that case. Spawn leaves wishing her happiness. In a nearby alleyway, Spawn's spell wears off and he returns to his vigilante costume. His pain only mounts. Why? Why are you torturing me? What kind of sadistic pleasure are you getting from this? You want my soul? Then come and get it. Just try and get it. I was going to give it to you willingly. Do you hear me? I just wanted my wife. Can't you understand that? You stole a Wanda from me, taking my face, my very existence away. And you even had to prove it was me who couldn't produce children. And to a man that holds a lot of weight to it. You definitely feel the pain and agony he's going through here. So much so that he threatens Malboja with, and he's not knowing that he's threatening Malboja at the time. He doesn't know who this demon is. If you're going to screw me, then I'm going to screw you too. You want my soul? Then come and get it. Let's see who's got the power. As if on cue, the clown walks up and threatens him again. This time, he transforms into his true form of the violet in front of Spawn's very eyes. All oh, the things you did when you were with the government, remember? You and I could have a million laughs together, says the violator. I don't know who or what you are, says Spawn, but I guarantee you picked the wrong time. If you're from the same hell pit I came from, then I've got a mess to send back to your boss. Good, says the violator. They said you had a lot of spunk. Now let's see how much heart you have here. Slightly surprised, Violator takes advantage of Spawn's distraction and quickly plunges his hand into his chest, ripping out his heart. Spawn collapsed on the ground at that moment. Violator walks away shocked that Malboja's favorite human was already dead. We later discover in later issues of Spawn, Violator wishes 
that Malboja didn't give so much control, so much power to humans of the Hellspawn symbiote suit. He feels humans don't deserve that. It should be in his control. But Malboja has his reasons. Violator walks away. He hears who said anything about being human from behind him and turns around to see Spawn rejuvenate with green necoplasm healing his heart. And that's where we end this issue of Spawn issue number three. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below. Let me know. I thought this was a fun read. I'm definitely enjoying Spawn the beginning story arc. We begin this issue with the quick summary of the events that transpired. Al Simmons has been trying to cope with his new so-called reality. You know, being Spawn. Also bringing Bob back from the dead, selling his soul, and getting shot five years into the future as a white man when he's a brother. You know, a brother from another mother. <laughs> Anyways, his whole reason for returning was his unrelenting love for his wife, Wanda. Now he sees that she is happily remarried and has a child, and that means he has been the problem. Now he feels like less of a man. His heart has been torn apart both emotionally and physically. After getting his heart ripped out by Violator, Spawn tells him, let's try that again, but this time try to do some real damage. As flames come out of his hand and he heals using his necroplasm, Violator can't believe what he's witnessing. He questions who and how Spawn got such powers. In his eyes, humans are fragile for this kind of thing. It's not every day humans experience their own heart being ripped from their chest. He looks at Spawn's beating heart in his hand and he realizes the obvious and he is enraged. He doesn't need a heart! And he thought he had the power stronger than Spawn. How can Spawn survive without a heart, he asked. No one warned the Violator about this. The Violator wants to have some words with the Master. Spawn continues his silence. For what does a man say to an offspring of the pit of hell? Maybe the obvious. Nothing. He picks up his own heart, heals it using his necroplasm power, puts it back in its place, and he's like, yeah, that's better. Now pay attention, demon. I know yo, master. The scum screwing with my life too. He seems to enjoy ruining people's life. And for the life of me, I can't understand why. But if he's messing with you and changing whatever deal you made with him, that's your problem. I'm still trying to deal with my problem. Unfortunately, you think things can't get worse for you? Wrong. You got an immediate problem to take care of. Namely me, because I'll be damned if anyone's going to rip out my heart and not pay. And Spawn blasts him with the energy blast. The force of Spawn's blast cars a hole through the violator the size of a basketball but it doesn't seem to phase violator you idiot you're not the only one that can survive an organ transplant i had the power long before you stumbled upon him and spawns like well so what's your point bruh my point boy if you're looking to play the old game eye for an eye game you're a bigger fool than i thought allow me to demonstrate and he tosses spawn on the other side of the panel and the reason why he does this is to flex his physical superiority and spawn lands on his feet and he's like okay so what's your point listen i'm not here to play some game with you says violator i'm here to keep you aligned make sure you don't stray why he's making such a big deal out of you i still haven't figured that out yet but until such time comes it's my job to show you the ropes and keep in mind the prophecy was made in spawn issue 174 or 175 which we did do a review on link in description feel free to watch that after watching this video and Violet continues his speech, just hope I don't get to strangle you with them. He wouldn't want that. Be a pity to see Spawn go down. <laughs> and so Spawn blasts him with another energy blast, another necroplasm energy blast. And Violet is like, ha, you're nice shooting, but you're supposed to hit the target chump. And they're just poking jabs and, you know, clapbacks at each other, you know? And Violet is like, now let me give you a pointer. So Violet and Spawn engage in a brutal showdown with both losing appendages. Violator is surprised Spawn is more powerful and claims he was supposed to be the stronger one. And I'm kind of digging how it's off panel. You don't get to see the violence. You have to imagine the violence because it has to be much more brutal than one would think. Who knows? That's up for the imagination. Now Malboja comes in and tells them both to stop. I gave the both of you far too much credit. It's not necessary to mutilate each other when neither of you can die. Like a pair of jealous siblings, you don't realize the two of you are part of the same family. And like it or not, I'm your daddy and both of you are my bitches. Well, he didn't say that, but it just kind of adds a little bit more sauce and saltiness to it, too. And like a good parent, I can see I need to share some insight to both of you boys to let you know what's going on. You see, destiny and damnation, you control neither. So even though you struggle to make sense of what's happening, it doesn't matter because I run both your lives. 
So Spawn tells him obviously to go to hell and you know Malboja laughs about it, you know such vigor and humor, but don't be surprised, I do have a soul and 8 billion others, nearly enough to satisfy my needs. Evil can be very addictive, especially after death. The accumulation of souls of the dam can have only one outcome, the destruction of God. Yes Simmons, there is a God. For an atheist like yourself, that might be a shock. But with all you've been through, I'm sure it's not such a hard concept to follow. So call him what you will, he is now your enemy, Simmons. And this was your choice, Simmons. I don't have the power to turn people away from God. They have to do that willingly. But once they do, I need to seize that moment and make them mine. Once I have them, my powers can and will control them forever, which is where you come in my dear spawn my army is not quite complete i need billions more for the forces of good are naturally quite strong to ensure my eventual victory though i need agents to do my bidding your past human life made you the perfect candidate young brash destructive ruthless and arrogant and a hired killer there's not too many of you around as one of my agents you needed powers to set you apart that was simple but I'd be a fool to make it limitless. You're wise enough to have sense the draining of that power spawn. If not, let me explain it to you. The more you use your energy, the faster you come to your second death. The slower you use it, the less chance you have of stopping evil around you. Either way, I eventually end up owning your soul. The only choice you have is how fast are you willing to give it to me? I mean, he's just pretty much adding salt to spawns when we're at this point, but my bow's just breaking it down. And all this because of some petty little emotion called love. You who are so predictable so you see my spawn from hell I can't lose it's either the depletion of your powers which leads to your death which leads to losing your soul to the darkness and simultaneously killing the so-called bad guys which helps build my army that much faster or you do nothing just stand by and let the evil and the ugliness prosper here on earth while your emotions grow colder as you justify to yourself why you needn't to do anything to those who prey on the innocent now let me heal that arm for you because there's no sense of you wasting any more power my child so my boja gives him a free arm he's in a charitable mood you know from a hell standpoint and Violet gets pissed. Hey, what about me? How about a little something for my effort? Look, boss, I did a hell of a job keeping an eye on some of the criminal activities, and I made the cops think there's a lunatic on the loose. Even put a bit of fear in the spawn's heart. Speaking of which, no one warned me of his powers when I got this assignment. I mean, look at this. Look at this arm. So in other words, Violet is like, yo, give me my arm back, and you failed to give me some useful information to help me do my job. But when Boja gets mad, puts Violator in his hands and tells him to silence and clutches him and closes his fist. Let him know, hey, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, and I'm more superior than you, and I'm smarter, and here's why. You have failed me miserably. It's a competence like you that make my battle against the God so laborious. I sometimes think that they're traitors among us. You, Violator, are a sad excuse for hell. I made you in my image, told you to keep a watchful eye on Spawn, Prod him if it called for, but you also abuse those powers by going on a killing spree with no agenda in mind. Now, the New York criminals are being cautious. Paranoid thieves serve me no purpose. You, my erratic child, are being grounded. Drops him in his clown form. Even though he heals his arm, he's bound to not morph and clown cannot morph. And clown cannot change form into the violent, and he is pissed about that. So even though Malboja restores Spawn's lost arm and shows pity on him, he punishes Violator for his unscheduled killing spree because it has influenced crime lords to slow down their evil ways. So he locks clown in his temporary form for a temporary period of time, but it's undisclosed. Clown yells that he doesn't mind being short, fat, and ugly, even though we know he does. With his rants and vent, you get the picture of how the clown really is. He does what he wants, when he wants, because he just wants to. Then he curses Malboja, and Spawn's looking down on him like, well, you want me to blast a hole through your chest and rip your limbs out again, or what? So in this panel right here at the Fitzgerald residence, Wanda Blake wakes up with a nightmare that Al was reaching out to her for help, but had changed somehow. Terry Fitzgerald lovingly supports her and feels she doesn't have to hide that she can't forget about Al. And that is the end of Spawn issue number four. The best parts about this issue is Spawn and Violator going at it and Malboja explaining the ground rules of everything that's happening to Spawn and that Wanda seems to have the nightmares of her late husband. And there might still be feelings left for him, 
Other than that, the issue delivers as promised. Confrontation between Spawn and Violator, it's fun. And Malboja explaining the ground rules to Spawn and Violator, it ties it all together. Now we know what's at stake here. Like the last issue, this is building up to something more. And here on this channel, we will continue building up on the Spawn content. At the Wingate Institution, Billy Kincaid has read his rights and claimed to be a cured man. He is being released from jail after good behavior. Let's not forget his lawyer's efforts, a technicality, and Dr. Reynolds testimony stating Billy Kincaid's competence. This is an eerie man who murders children just for fun. Billy eerily smiles in his panel. He's told that the judge wanted to remind Billy to not have any contact with the dead girl's parents. He's silent but in a creepy kind of way. You already know something's off, but the psychiatrist plays it off as Billy being overwhelmed with the whole procedure. Detective Sam Burke knows that this whole thing is off and that this man is a freaking sicko. He slaughtered a girl so bad it took six experts to identify the girl, and they only got him for one murder when Sam knew there was much, much more. Sam can tell by looking into Billy's eyes that he's not a cured man. Inside Billy's head, time is his friend. That's what helped him with the sentence. It was worth the wait and he remembers those good times. It was so easy to lure children into this ice cream truck because children do love their sweets. During his sentence, he never stopped thinking about it. He hated that he didn't remember all their names. He sings his favorite song, you scream, I scream, we all scream for ice cream. Billy reminds himself of the final number of kills. He did 27 freaking children. As he leaves, Billy sings about the ice cream song and Sam Burke, who's standing right behind him, screams that he's insane and not actually cured. He calls Billy the walking butcher. Sam believes that the murder of Amanda Jennings was not an isolated incident and he is correct about that. Sam thinks about how he's always played by the law, but the law sometimes doesn't win. He believes in the law and understands it far too well. He reminisces the night he lost his partner in the name of the law. But through all the obscene situation that he has been sucked into, Sam never lost sight of what matters most to uphold the law and to protect and serve at all costs. You get the sense that he's up to something, but will he compromise his beliefs? What is he gonna do? In Queens, Wanda puts Cyan to sleep in her crib. She stands at her daughter's crib side for nearly 10 minutes, smiling down at the child she thought she'd never have, all while Spawn falls asleep in the alleyway amongst trash and rubble. Sam and Twitch Williams discuss the release of Billy at the New York City Police Headquarters. Sam doesn't know why, but his blood boils every time he thinks of Billy. Part of it is because with that girl, Jennings, he did things to her that were beyond belief, like pulling her teeth out by pliers and dropping maggots into her cuts. And that's based on the reports that Sam read. Twitch reminds Sam that Billy's constitutional rights must be upheld, even though this is very close to him because Twitch has seven children that he loves dearly. Sam vents some more about this, and Twitch offers that they might be able to find a loophole in all this. They agree to perform a midnight stakeout to see if Billy has reformed just a couple friends doing a little male bonding in the same neighborhood by coincidence near a certain killer. Kid killer at that. Two days after his release, Billy takes Shirley Johnson. He offers her a free popsicle, anything she wants from his selection inside his truck. She enters, and you already know it's not going to end well. He ends up fingerprinting with her fingers cut off and glued to his wall. And to make matters more unsettling on Billy, he dresses up and we see Shirley's bloody dress on the floor. Now we fast forward to Cyan, excited to see Wanda after daycare. And by the way, if you're liking the content so far, you know what to do. Like the video and subscribe to this channel. Here at Rated Comics, we do awesome comic book reviews, comic book related content with the occasional comic book giveaway. Now, back into the content. Spawn is watching nearby in a trench coat. Hearing Wanda calling Terry an amazing dad tears through his heart like a bullet. It's a name he so desperately wanted to be called during his life with Wanda. Now he knows that will never happen and to make it worse is he can't blame the devil for this one. A short time after, he retreats to a place he spends his nights. It's a night a few of the guys get together for a few laughs and a few slightly exaggerated stories. In this panel, bums get hit by cops. The cops are driving like this because they got a robbery in progress and they're rushing to get the scene of the crime. 
Not the greatest excuse to run over the homeless in alleyways, but that's their reasoning. By the way, link in description if you wish to add this comic book and or any of Rated Comics exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. The boys in the alleyway express their disapproval that the cops can break the law to everyone and no one is looking their way when they do it. And they're not protecting and serving from anything. An example of that is the release of Billy King Kate. They express anger over his release. Spawn overhears, recalls how he was hired by Jennings for a hit on King Kate. Cops go to him first. Problem was, they found all the mutilated bodies but evidence went missing, and then the shack blew up. What bothered Al Simmons as he watches Billy gets arrested by the cops was that he was smiling in a creepy manner. He found out two weeks later in an abandoned shack in Northeast Virginia were remains, multiple bodies, all kids so mutilated that they never did get the final body count. The shack belonged to Billy Kincaid. They had enough evidence to get him 10 lifetime terms, but suddenly things start disappearing. Files, photos, and containers. The shack where they found the evidence blew up. Not burnt down, but just blew up. Nothing was left. Their proof of untold deaths was gone. The real kicker was Jason Wynn then told everyone to drop the case, and they did. No questions asked. It was one of the thousand reasons why Jason and Al fought. So Al put it on the back burner for the time being. It wasn't the hill to die on, so to speak. Realizing this, Spawn needs a distraction from all this craziness he's been going through. His adrenaline is pumping now. Anger. With all that's wrong in his life, the only way to take his mind off of things is with work. He intends on cleaning up that mess he left behind. He leaves to take out Billy once and for all. With Sam and Twitch on stakeout outside of Billy's house, Spawn sneaks in through the back. Sam and Twitch do not notice Spawn. Upon looking in the window, Spawn spots Shirley Johnson's bloody dress. He thinks to himself that it doesn't matter who he takes out next. It could be anyone's kids at this point. Even Wanda's, and that's all the motivation he needs to go through it to the end. He's about to add another soul to Malboja's army. Issue number four reference. Spawn moves into the house to make his move. Twitch spots a cape figure in the back and they both move in. Billy pulls out a knife with that eerie grin on his face. Sam wonders if the cape figure works with Kincaid. Sam and Twitch kick down the door and once inside the house, they find the evidence, but no Billy. Back at the New York police headquarters, Sam and Twitch begin plotting their search for Billy. When they walk into a back room, they find Billy Kincaid's body, bloodied and strangled with chains and a note with popsicles impaled inside of him. It reads, boy scream and girl scream. So I made him scream and scream and scream. And that is the end of this issue, Spawn, issue number five, and the end of Spawn, the beginning story arc. What a brutal issue. And does Billy deserve this kind of ending? It was pretty savage what he did. I mean, I like to say my opinions on it, man. Uh, oh my gosh, it was a great ending for the story arc right there. But comment below, let me know your thoughts on this. We begin this issue in Sicily. Overkill takes down a building for the Mafia. The message is clear. You mess with the Mafia and they'll mess with you. The military has been called, but there's nothing much they can do. A multinational firm had refused to cooperate on all levels, so the crime cartel decided to do some leveling on its own. That leveling came in the form of Overkill. The reason why he was given that name was because of his tendency to go beyond the necessary means. He quickly dispatches the men after taking several rounds of bullets and explosive damage. He leaves virtually unscathed. To the Mafia, this is a perfect employee that does the job with enthusiasm, service with a smile. Even when the military tries to take out Overkill with a full-on tank, he leaps high into the air and comes crashing down with everything he has. It's reasons like this why the Mafia is able to hold on to power for so long. In this panel right here, Freddy, a hobo, gives up Spawn's location in exchange for drugs. 10 ounces of powder by 8 p.m. the next day is what Freddy wants. Once he reveals that Spawn stays on 42nd and 6th Street when he's there, but moves around a lot, the mobsters kill him before completing their end of the bargain. So now the mobsters report back to their boss, Tony Twist, in his office. He tells the guys that there's got to be more to this mystery man, referring to Spawn, than that meets the eye. Anyone who could rip hearts out of humans shouldn't be taken lightly. He wants Spawn to suffer before he's killed. Then his last request, bring me his heart. 
Meanwhile, in the alley, several homeless people offer comfort to Spawn. They invite him to sit next to them and share his story. They don't want Spawn to be afraid of them as he always sits aloof. Spawn then tells him his story, his backstory, with Wanda and Cyan. And I'll sum it up for you rather quickly if you guys watch Spawn Beginnings, issues number one through five. If not, I'll be sure to put the playlist at the end of this video. The location is Queens, New York, and the story is about a mother, a father, and a baby. The mother is Wanda Blake, Spawn's wife, and she believed Al to be dead for five years. Now she's remarried with a beautiful daughter named Cyan, who's 15 months old. Her new husband is Terry Fitzgerald, a good father and a caring spouse and the best friend to Al Simmons, which makes the situation more tragic. Why should Al intrude or leave Wanda to live her new life in peace? Neither choice will bring her happiness to all involved. Involved. Until Spawn reaches a decision, he will be haunted by this no-win situation that's slowly tearing him apart. And by the way, if you're liking the content we're throwing up, you know what to do. Don't be shy, don't be stingy. Like and subscribe to Rated Comics, the YouTube channel. Here on Rated Comics, we do awesome comic book reviews, comic book related content with the occasional comic book giveaway. Not to mention, feel free to check out the playlist at the end of this video if you wish to catch up on all the Spawn content as you try to cover all the Spawn issues. So far, we've covered issues 1 through 6 and issue 296 through the current run so far. Lastly, check out RatedComics.com for some amazing comics to add to your comic book collection not to mention we have some really cool rated comics exclusives as well with all that being said let's get back into the content when the two mobsters start wasting random bums looking for spawn Al shows up and takes out one of the mobsters he demands to know who's after him and why after spawn gets his answer he takes him out too at a meeting with the mobsters, Gavino recommends Overkill to take out Spawn. Word spreads quickly that the mob requests a meeting with the person responsible for the deaths of the seven leaders, courtesy of the Violator of course, but Spawn is the one to answer the call, cause he has to be cause they think it's him. Now added to that request is another homeless victim. He's not happy that all the street people are under threat by implied association. When he arrives, Spawn asks that they now show themselves, if they dare, out come overkill they size one another up they get some name calling out the way you know boys got to be boys before the boys throw down kind of thing but someone has to make the first move in this case it's overkill he was going to kill spawn quickly but why in his opinion there's no point in hurrying the two score off while overkill easily overpowers him spawn does trick him into messing up his robot hand before rendered near death Spawn refuses to use his powers to spare them as long as possible so that he can continue to live on Earth and ask questions about his past and get those answers too. Overkill continues to taunt Spawn some more, wanting to see evidence of him having the power to rip men's hearts out. He wants his trip to America to be worth it. Overkill walks away, unaware that Spawn is still alive after pounding him into submission. Spawn heals himself with necroplasm and heads to a warehouse on an army base to pick up guns and ballistics. To preserve his power and avoid second death, he's going to use the skills he already has as a former mercenary. Now equipped with the knowledge of fighting the half-breed cyborg, he's ready for round two. And that's where we end this issue of Spawn, issue number six. Hey, I'm definitely enjoying going back old school with the Spawn comic books. And by the way, link in description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection and or any other comic books or rated comics exclusives to your comic book collection as well. After Spawn's first round battle against Overkill, he avoided using his powers during his battle to avoid his second death, which was explained in issue number four. He suffered two cracked ribs and a broken arm. He had to use his necroplasm energy to fix that. As a former government paid assassin, he was privy to locations where secret warehouses had guns and ballistics. Now he's feeling comfortable and ready for round two. Spawn hurries his scavenger mission as US troops burst into the room. Though he's primed for action and he can deal with them, rather than fight them, he teleports away to save their lives and to conserve his power. Though this is Spawn's first time teleporting, we all remember our first time, right? <laughs> Mine wasn't until college, but anyways, that's probably TMI for some of you. His molecules are ripped apart one by one, then together with the existing molecule structures present. Then he's reassembled as fiercely as they were separated, reappearing in the alleyway. A drunk bum helps him and offers him alcohol. 
Hey, ain't nothing wrong with that. But because he's drunk, when the bum takes off Spawn's mask, he's not too surprised by Al's look at all. He says they gave up judging people on the surface long ago. Spawn realizes they accept him and don't care about his outside appearance. Spawn cries out and experiences a flashback. He can't recall his killer's face, but is given hints. A piece of his forgotten past is trying to tie together the final clues of his death. He keeps seeing pictures of the Grim Reaper in his mind. The Grim Reaper tells him it was a pleasure killing him, and he would have done it even if he wasn't paid for it. Snapping back to reality, oh, there goes gravity. Anyways, he runs from the alleyway. In this panel right here, Tony Twist asks who Overkill would work for if Bartino dies. Bartino is Overkill's employer. Overkill tells Tony Twist that he will not leave until he is 100%. It won't do his reputation any good if he goes back home less than perfect. Twist agrees to cover the repairs of his arm. In Queens, New York, Wanda Blake wakes up screaming, Stop! Don't kill him! During the last few weeks, she can't stop thinking about Al's tortured soul. She now believes Al was murdered by someone instead of him dying in action. Terry comforts her and tells her that he'll check Al's files again. And that's because she was playing that Al was murdered and didn't die in action. Spawn decides to take on the Mafia. The way he sees it, his existence puts all these guys in the alleyway in danger. Since someone wants Spawn dead and they're willing to carve a blood bath of a path to do so, plus this homeless person's lack of judgment when he sees Al's disfigured face gives Al something more to fight for than just Wanda. He has his ways and he wants to even the score. He takes off the cape as it will only get in the way. Unknown to him, the cape follows him as he walks away. In this panel right here, Wanda is curious about when Al visited her in disguise. This is a reference to issue number three. When she checks at the local pound, she learns that no man matching her description of the man that works there. She begins pondering if Terry is in trouble and if the man was spying on him just out of the blue. All this thinking that Wanda is doing with the white guy from issue number three, even though that was Al and Terry in the dream, is just driving Wanda crazy, so to speak. At night, the perfect time for Spawn to do his work. He breaks into a high-rise mob building where he threatens Twist himself. He tells her to deliver a message to Overkill to meet him in battle at the nearby pier. Business isn't finished yet and we hungry. Overkill shows up at the pier and he's ready for round two. So is Spawn. Hey hero, seems I screwed up. Should have ripped your freaking head off to make sure you was dead. I intend to correct my oversight. Thanks for the invite. Shall we play? Gladly, says Spawn, and Spawn leaps to safety, goes nowhere as Overkill darts at him. Now, Spawn doesn't realize that he's forgotten about his loose hanging chains as Overkill grabs onto him. It felt so natural for him to hold a gun again that he half forgot his new situation. He can regret that at his leisure, so as of right now, he has to grab onto some flying piece of debris and improvise and puts that in his eyes. Even though at this moment, Spawn gained the advantage, there's no reason to celebrate though. Wounding a machine only leaves you with the angry machine. It must be terminated. And Overkill is pissed. You scarred me for a second time i can't have that and he blasts off but you want to be scarred says spawn i'll show you hell in the flesh take a good look i'm patient and this doesn't really phase overkill he just tells you you look like crap you know the smelly oozy kind now i'm gonna stomp on you so i can scrape you off my boot you piece of shit and guess what even though he didn't say the s word i did for dramatic reasons spawn blasts off on him and he takes that ballistic machine from the warehouse and puts it to work and that just leaves overkill looking like a skeleton piece of debris at that point and spawn tells him so who's laughing now i fought your kind before this is where the fun comes in and he just goes to work and pretty much demoralizes overkill at this point with all the noise has been made he knows the authorities will be called and he needs to leave but not before he takes a moment to revel in his handiwork and not before he sets the timer of an electromagnetic bomb and that should take care of overkill for good at least so he thinks as he slips away into the night he thinks about his home in the alley and how he'll curl up behind some rusty dumpster for a well-deserved night's sleep a long comfortable night sleep and that's where we end this issue of spawn issue number seven i'm enjoying these spawn classics right here going back old school
We begin this issue with Billy Kincaid in the Sack of Syrup after his death from issue number five. So this kind of time jump from issue number five to right now. And we go from Billy Kincaid, the child murderer, to Billy Kincaid, Hale's play toy. And he noticed he's dead, but he also noticed that in this sack of syrup, he's not breathing. And you got a love on the ground that says, in heaven, everything is fine. Let's you know where he's actually at. So he asks himself, what kind of afterlife is this? He's stuck in sticky goo and he's buck naked. So he notices this four-eyed lizard thing and kills it and takes its skin for clothing. Now he reassures himself like, yeah, it's kind of nice knowing that even though you're still dead, he can still kill people or kill things so he gets introduced by Kimberly and she has his eating disorder and she introduces Billy to Larry Claudette Bob and little Jessica who introduced himself and he gets all creepy like my name is Chili Mr. Chili real name's Bill Billy Kincaid because he's a child murder he's offbeat he's deranged he's just crazy man and even right now he's still crazy with little Jessica so they're inside the orchid but outside the orchid there's nothing but wilderness and they invite Billy Kincaid to follow them and go on the trail so they explain to him what goes on here. It's kind of weird. They're like in 10 deadlands, spheres. So there's 10 spheres inside hell. And right now they're at the lowest sphere, the reception area, if you will. If you want to go higher, you have to climb to the tower. And then Claudette's like, oh, Lord, look at everybody. He's come for me. And this ray of light, I imagine she's thinking is God picking her up because she says, I went in for my gallbladder operation and I woke up in that orchard. But now I knew he would come for me. Well, is it really God? that came for her no in this panel right here it's actually the soul trapper from the sixth fear that's what little jessica tells him they keep souls like her as pets as she's singing away from this sentient droid demon whatever I, I don't even know how to describe what that looks like so little jessica continues to tell billy king kate and us as a reader that this year it's singers last year it's acrobats that the soul trappers are taking so as they lay down to go to sleep billy king kate goes into his monologue i think about the kid as we camp down for the night so she's a little autistic whatever disturbed that's natural but being dead is kind of a disturbing thing but dying's worse. I dream about all night long the sound of chains, cloak, flapping and spikes and choking me. I never want to see that thing again. He's talking about Spawn when Spawn put him through that torturous pain endurement in issue number five because if you checked out that issue, Spawn had his reasons for doing it. Come on, it's Billy Kincaid we're talking about. So as they're walking around through the orchard, it's been three hours and this ray of light disintegrates Larry. So little Jessica tells Billy Kincaid that was the prime monad from the highest fear the tenth he handpicked souls to use as secretary in his macro computer kind of a twisted sense of humor i guess you would say but then again they keep rolling around and then they see elvis bob is an elvis fan but this is not no typical looking elvis the king humma 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 you know this is elvis looking like with he don't look right let's just say but so he takes bob in his tentacles and little Jessica tells him there's nothing you could do for that. That is a meta abuse from the fifth spear. They get an addictive drug rush from souls of people like Bob. So we get a twisted world of what kind of place this is. So Billy continues to tell him, so this is great. Three of us left, the kids a cycle, and I'm getting Kimberly. But when she goes up to this crystal, well, this rock that she considers her pet or whatever swallows her whole and stands up and just takes her away so the kid tells billy it's a soul gourmet from the third sphere so pretty soon after all this it gets dark and just all of a sudden how does it get around there well billy kincaid tells her, the kid finds him a place to sleep and as they sleep and dream a flight of bats surrounds his bro his cloak seethes like boiling blood he's talking about spawn he's dreaming about spawn ending his life again and that torturous pain and and how he died and he can't stand it so he wakes up in a cold sweat and he knows what's got to be done the kid's sleeping by the campfire and it's the only way to get it out of his system and to stop the dreams and he looks at the kid sweet angelic and sleep she's not gonna know a thing about him ending her life right and as he puts her hand around her throat she opens her eyes in this sinister smile and it's just creepy well it's about time I wonder how long it'll be before you croak the little know-it-all bitch glad to see that you still got what it takes Chile. that's a reference to what, Sp what King K told her earlier in the panel and he morphs into this <laughs> ugly looking thing great disguise huh I mean flimsy but cute as hell I'm the vindicated one of the five famous Flibiac brothers I guess you probably heard 
heard of us, huh? Well, yes, we have because you look very relative to the to the to the violator, and he is a relative to the violator. Sorry about entrapping you like that, says the vindicator. I just had to make sure you was the kind of guy we want up in the eighth sphere. And Billy Kincaid's like, nah, uh, fuck that shit. I gotta get up out of here. Hey, where you going? Trust me, you'll like the eighth sphere. Everybody does. That stuff ain't what it what it all cracked out to be. Everyone's saying it's a reeking sulfurous torture furnace, which just rumors spread by the business rivals, and I believe that was spread by the second sphere. And Billy Kincaid's like, nah, man, I gotta get out of here. The kid that thinks that the only way was up is through that tower, and he feels he's still has a chance but he goes up but because Billy Kincaid to say it nicely because I'm that way too is a little out of shape boy these stairs huh said the vindicator just mess with them are they murder or what I'll tell them to put an elevator the one with the glass I mean it might be nice for you to ride the elevator right hey they gotta make things more difficult around her huh and Billy Kincaid's like man I cannot go any further this is stupid hey no problem, Mo, says the Vindicator. I was just going to carry you if you had to run off like that. You got to think yourself lucky you've been harvested by the 8th Sphere. I mean, a dead guy like you, what are your options? So he goes on to explain what the different levels of the Sphere are. Level 2, it's pretty much ice and chili. Level 3, well, if you want to get filleted and serve with the light pastry, that's where you go. Level 4, you'll be fuel rod, but then they see him as special because he's a child murderer and they appreciate that in the guy. And I see in action, Mr. Chile, I got to say you're too good for that so we get to know what five six seven and eight are and eight is a place that they call home it's the Malbos, and the vindicator calls it home so that's where they want to take billy king k to the eighth fear so he continues to tell him as it happens the Malboja himself is looking for souls to join his army souls like you billy and billy's like man this place is kind of hot and it's burning my feet oh that won't bother you once you're fitted into your slaves where all the Mount Boja conquests were. Here, I'll whistle a ride up for you. Phew, weep. I can't even whistle. So Billy Kincaid's symbiote comes out. So Vindicator tells her, let me introduce you to K3 Myarlu. She's a constantly involving neutral parasite and I think she likes it. And this freaks Billy Kincaid because this looks too much like Spawn. No, not that. I don't want it. Oh, come on now. I know you what you're thinking. You just got to give it a chance, boy. Believe me, I have a feeling that that you guys are gonna get along very nicely. He runs and he screams. And Vindicator, as this symbiote is bonding to Billy Kincaid, oh, look at you two bonding. I tell you, when a guy like her finds someone like you, things happen, real special things. And there's two things. First, this is for life. And two, the second, it bonds with your central nervous system. Ooh, look at that bond, look at that. And Billy Kincaid just looks like overweight spawn at this point. And he is shocked to see what he says. So Vindicator opens up this doorway for him and tells him, so anyway, now that you're all dressed up, go meet your new employer. Look, the gates are opening for you. And Billy Kincaid is not liking this at all. But this isn't fair. The afterlife shouldn't be this way full of alien monsters processing humans as if they were cattle and nobody caring about good or evil good evil give me a break says the vindicator like we could carry less if you covet your neighbor's ox or whatever and that is biblical that is in uh, exodus i believe exodus chapter 20 or whatnot i mean we're running a business here says the vindicator and i'm telling you for nothing the two words carved on marble in hell's lobby ain't good or evil boy it's two other words and what they say is and malboja laughs <laughs> <laughs> Kaka happens, little buddy. Kaka happens. And that's where we end this issue of Spawn, issue number eight. What do you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know. And also link in description if you wish to add any of the comic books in your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. We do got some really cool rated comics exclusives as well. 800 years ago in a journal entry, Angela reads about Hell Spawn and Heaven's goal of exterminating them. She reads about the rules specified are only for Hell Spawns and living realms, and those in beyond realms are not to be touched unless an official declaration of war is made with Hell. The entry explains the best way to kill a Hell Spawn is when it is still new and unadjusted to its car space or in other words, adjusted to its symbiote costume. That is when they are chronically confused and new at using their powers. Because of this, they are also brass and use way too much power as opposed to a more experienced Hellspawn. For this reason, while they're most vulnerable as a new Hellspawn, they are also potentially more dangerous and unpredictable because they're new, they don't, they're getting used to their powers, and you ain't no telling what their habits are. The journal explains that these Hellspawns are sent to Earth. 
usually once every hundred years, and no more than one at a time are potential officers in Malboja's future war. The living realm acts as a trial to see if they are fit to lead. The best way to kill them is a surprise attack, but beware their suit or car pace as they are equally wily in their younger years. Angela recalls posing as a young woman in distress in the 12th century when Medieval Spawn, a new hell spot at the time, spots her. She asks him to take her to a remote location to save her sister from an ogre. Angela recalls reading how new hell spawns are drawn to people who need help when they are first reborn. In the cave, she surprises him from behind and strikes him with her dimensional lance to kill him. In the present day, 800 years later, Spawn speaks with Callisto Yostro, who not only knows his name, but knows about hell and how it operates. And during their conversation, Callisto Yostro requests Spawn to summon wine as training and a reward exercise. And Spawn is not sure how he can do that, being a new hell Spawn and all. Cox tells him to close his eyes and concentrate. Feel it deep inside himself, but not too deep as it'll lower Spawn's energy levels. The trick is pulling energy from a symbiote costume. The costume is a neutral parasite, but that doesn't mean he can't borrow a little energy from it. So he finally makes one appear out of thin air using a little bit of his power. In this panel right here, Angela appears at work where she meets Gabriel who informs where Raffaella has left her in charge of this world. Gabriel is an angel who is the director at the Terrain Affairs headquarters after the departure of Raffaella. Angela shows her little regard for Gabriella talking down to her for being a freelancer and Angela reveals that she has a hunting permit. Gabriel admits she can't stop her from hunting, but she requests it to be quick, clean, and not to make her job harder than what it needs to be. Whatever that means, they keep it low and discreet, I guess. None of that stalking and trailing nonsense. Just get the kill and get in and get out with it. Angela heard there's a new hell spawn that has surfaced. Al Simmons and she wants some of that smoke. So in this panel right here we go back to Spawn and Callisto Yosha talking and Spawn tells him for the last time I want to know how you knew I was Al Simmons and Cog's like geez you're a good kid but you're really not very bright. You got a ways to go my man. I mean I know all about your costume and the phase you went through with Malboja. What phase you talking about? You know Malboja the guy you made a deal with to give me this costume and I'll serve you just as long as I get my wife back kind of guy. And Spawn's like I see. So so you know that I did a deal with the devil. And Cog's like, yes, you did do a deal with the devil. You hadn't even stopped to think about it just one second. I mean, to think about which deal you done the devil with? Like, there's a lot of devils. And Spawn's like, what? I thought there was only one devil. No. You don't get it, do you? Listen, kid, half the guys in this alleyway did a deal with the devil at some point. Their devil gave them power and wealth and love and fame, everything they ever wanted. Then he come collecting, and they have to be bums in the alleyway for the next however long that needs to be. That's how I came about in the picture. So look, Sonny, meaning Spawn, there's a lot you don't understand but what's been happening to you. And then Angela taps Spawn behind the back, excuse me, can we talk? And Spawn's like, look, man, who are you? Men call me Angela. Look, Angela, says Spawn, if you don't mind, I'm kind of busy right now, and I've got a lot on my mind. And she's like, I know. That's how I got this close. And then she transforms into warrior Angela, and they go into battle right now. And she uses her dimensional lance to pin Spawn down. Hey, lady, says Spawn, I don't want to hurt you. I know, says Angela. I don't want to hurt you either. I want to destroy you. And she blasts him, and Spawn turns into this flimsy, rubbery, liquid symbiote goo. And she looks at him just in that goop. But for some reason, she goes in. And when she goes in and they go into this dimension where Angela and Spawn have this moment, I don't know if Angela realizes this is too much power for me. She tells him, please, I can't. Please, I guess she's being summoned back by either Rachel or Gabriella or something like that. So she goes up into the air and all they could just do is look at in amazement and say, wow. And Cog's like, hey, Simmons, that was pretty impressive. You don't often see an angel take off like that, like a bat out of hell. That was an angel, says Spawn, but she tried to kill me. Like I said, Al, there's a lot you don't know. She dropped this, says Al. He picks up her dimensional lance, and he, there's some kind of button that he notices. And when he pushes that button, he gets beamed up. And that's where we end this issue with Cog saying, like I said, a good kid, just not very bright. And we get a quick glimpse at Spawn's rookie years in Spawn issue number nine. What you guys think of this comic book? Comment below, let me know. And also, if you'd like to add this comic book to your comic book collection, if you're a comic book collector of key issues, this is definitely one you may 
may want to consider because it's the first appearance of Callisto Yostro, Angela, and Medieval Spawn in the Spawn series. So definitely consider that adding to your collection. Also, check out RatedComics.com if you wish to add some really cool Rated Comics exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art. Support the... So we begin this issue where we left off in the last issue of Spawn issue number 9. When Spawn tries to examine Angela's abandoned lance, it transports him into a realm beyond his wildest imagination. So we start off with Spawn saying he is Spawn and he is not Spawn because he is Spawn for all that he shares his memories and he remembers his death and the skeletal face which haunts him day and night and he's talking about the violator he knows the burning gaze of the violator and the stench of his hot breath and he can still feel the ache of his heart being ripped from his chest and then he goes back to saying but i am not spawn for i know many things spawn doesn't know i know the names of the two detectives who pursue him i know when and how they finally meet i know why the little one is called twitch and they all have forgotten about themselves it's a very trippy monologue between him knowing that he is spawn and that he is not spawn and he is not spawn because Unlike Spawn, he knows every inch of the network of the alleyways which cut through the city like a scar that has never properly healed. And he knows the tower in hell where the Violator dwells. He knows every level of the tower and all who live there screaming. Every level except level 7. And what I notice when I read this and reread this, that I am not Spawn, I think it should be read as him being Todd McFarlane, the creator is identifying with his creation and switching places, as he is not Spawn because he can do whatever he pleases and it will not drain his powers. And I will explain more of that as we go into this issue. So when he goes into I am not Spawn, teleporting doesn't drain his powers as it does. It's like he's not even teleporting, it's as if he already exists everywhere in in Spawn's world, he's everywhere and anywhere, and all he has to do is focus clearly on a specific location, and he is there. Now, now he will know everything. And now he's in the alleyway, and it's not the alleyway that he's known of. There's a line of men, their hands are bound behind them, they're hooded, helpless. I don't know them, but he feels a connection to them because without them, without them, Spawn could not exist. The flames are forming, and he wants to see, but he looks away. He can't look away, but he wants to know everything. But when he looks, he sees all these hands of all these heroes, champions, watchmen, avengers, defenders, men of steel, woman of tomorrow, god of thunder, Thor, creator, Batman, Hulk, all these heroes that are stuck in injustice. And the symbolism I love that they're showing here is that these Marvel and DC characters got bad endings because their creator sold them to big corporations. While Spawn, you're gonna see the ending here. And there's a lot of symbolism here because there's justice and nobility with these characters, but they're trapped and they're screaming. Behind him are the hooded men beneath their hoods. They're weeping and crying for that injustice. And his power leads him something unimaginable. This unlimited power pounding at the bars of this prison because he is not Spawn. He is, I think it's Todd McFarlane saying that he's not Spawn, but he's Todd McFarlane, the creator of Spawn. Unimaginable power until the air itself as he unleashes his beam as heavy as a heart of a star. To free those trapped heroes in the cage, their hands retreat behind the bars. And after he does that blast, he can hear the voices in his head hundreds of voices thousands of voices tens of thousands of voices they're all gone they're nowhere to be seen and but they beg spawn that the power that they have spawn should take it our power spawn is yours take it the heroes beg him to do it and then a lone voice a voice filled with hope and with great caring strong and noble the voice of he who came First, and I believe Superman was the first comic book superhero, if I'm not mistaken, from Action Comics. And I know there's a lot of you that know way more history about comic books than I do, but I believe that's what this reference is. And it's Superman. His planet exploded and he was sent to Earth as an infant. So this has got to be Superman. My powers is your spawn. Take it. And in Spawn's mind, he winks at him and he flashes a broad smile. Beneath his mask, he smiles back and nods silently. So Spawn takes their powers and it flows into him, surging through every limb. His power, which he thought to be unlimited, 
is nothing compared to this. His arms are the earth and the stars and the planets and all the galaxies that ever were and will ever be. They swing forward easily and all the power now concentrated in the tips of his fingers explode and he strikes and it has no effect. And now here's the violet, a woman's figure with the violet's head blindfolded holding a set of scales. And I love how the violator told him, you failed, buddy boy, you failed. But he's wearing a woman's dress with cash all around it, blindfolded. And because the heroes are symbolized being caged and the creators being bagged and bonded by corporations because they really sold them to big corporations, so they really don't have that freedom. In here, the violator is a symbol of the corporations making billions and Superman now alone in the prison just looks depressing. And this is sad, and, and that's what the Violator is to me. A symbol of the corporations making billions off of these characters, and these characters are just caged up, not really having a chance for freedom. Or creative freedom, I should say. So, in this panel, Cerebus calls out Spawn. Come on, man, let's go. But Spawn's like, but I have to save him, I have to save those heroes, and Cerebus is like, you can't. It's best not to think about it. Cerebus has been here for 15 years, and Cerebus knows, and Spawn asks him, well, who are they? They're superheroes. Their creators are the ones who sold them. Like Cerebus said, it's best not to think about them. And that's who the men were in the with the tarps over their head with their hands behind their backs. So Spawn's like, everything is gray, black and white and gray. And Spawn gets called. Now all of a sudden we get this panel of color and Spawn's like, man, this is a beautiful house. What is it? It's your home. It's my home, says Spawn. Yeah, living room, fireplace, a bunch of bedrooms. Yeah, and it's a great view of the hood too in a satellite dish. Your wife will be home soon. Her name's Wanda, but you know, she's a high school teacher, a real looker. And you'll see, oh, and you're going to love this. And Cerebus opens the door and Spawn Spawn sees his daughter Wanda and he goes into tears as Wanda calls out for her dad, da, da, da. And Cerebus tells Spawn that her name is Cyan. And Spawn's like, man, that's a beautiful name, you know? So they have this moment. He hugs her, kisses her. Spawn's like, yo, man, can you stay? I've got a million questions. And turns out, long story short, Cerebus cannot stay. So he has to leave. And we end this issue with Spawn holding Cyan as he walks down the stairs and he sees Wanda and is greeted by Wanda and she tells him, honey, I'm home. Did you have a nice day? Yes, Wanda. Yes, I did. I had a bad dream and to think about it, but you know, it's best not to think about it. And Cyan says, da, 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 da. Now, I love the symbolism that Spawn has a house while these characters from Marvel and DC characters got bad endings because their creators sold them to corporations. And Spawn gets a good ending in this house in color because Todd McFarlane decided to keep the rights to Spawn. And I love how this issue was touched because it represents perfectly the relationship between the creator and the character. And I believe these characters are creatively strapped by these corporations, but that's just the way I take it. But with all that being said, what you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know. Also, link in description if you wish to add this comic book and or other comic books and or some rated comics exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. We begin this issue with Spawn saying, let's get back to reality. He's been having nightmares, and that's the only way he can explain all this. But the truth is, as we know from the previous issue and issue number nine, it wasn't really a nightmare, or maybe it was. But he was transported after pushing that button in Angela's Lance in issue number nine and being transported to this crazy, trippy world in issue number 10 where he met Cerebus and all the other characters of Marvel and DC and you gotta watch that review to get the whole context of it. But Spawn wakes up screaming and these guys, Boots and Billy, tell him it ain't real, Spawn. Come on now, they'll call a cop. Stop screaming like that. And Billy apologizes to Al, so he slaps the heck out of him. And Spawn, or Al Simmons, tells him, Poppy and Boots, guys, thank God it's you, man. I was having this trip here. I was in this weird world. Demons, new age girls, really mean angels. And it's talking Ardvac. He's talking about Cerebus in issue number 10. And they're like, are you tripping, man? Boots is like, usually with me, it's rats and lizards and beetles when I have dreams. But I mostly get bats. But I guess in your case, it must be the wine you're drinking. And Spawn's like, it ain't the wine I'm drinking, man. So they ask Spawn, well, tell me the real story. We haven't heard nothing about you. So what's the sob story with you, my man? And Spawn tells him, well, that's a long story and it doesn't have a punchline. Let's just say that all I know is I'm kind of like Boots over there. He's so in love with his boots, that's, that's what we call him. So that's all he's got to care for. And all I've got is you guys, just like that guy in his boots, which is why we call him Boots. 
I care for you guys. So you're my friends and this is my home. So a loud explosion happens and Bobby's like, Spawn, you're going the wrong way. And Spawn's instincts tell him to run towards the action where these guys like you and I, they're going to run away from the action. And Spawn's like, that's a 50 millimeter tsunami. It's Japanese. Cops do not use it. It's military. So Spawn has seen this weapon in action before, back when he was Al Simmons and he was alive. It's a handheld tank stopper. Use it on a human and you're talking about getting spaghetti sauce, the lumpy and thick kind. And this damn thing brings Spawn back all the way back to the wrong kind of memories as this machine gun or whatever it is knocks him back. This girl tells him to save her and before Spawn could do any saving, Spawn and the girl get shot. And because of that, it ends the girl's life. So speaking of spaghetti sauce from earlier, the lumpy kind, that's what they'll both be if Al Simmons were still alive and still human. But for the girl, it doesn't make a speck of difference because she is now pronounced dead. So this brother comes in, this oversized brother named Boomer, and Bobby's like, you son of a bitch, you killed my pal. And Spawn has a huge hole in the back right there, as you can see. And Boomer's like, maybe I'll kill you too, you drunk old turd. I got a case of the nasty tonight. And Spawn's like, me too. A real bad case, and it's all your fault. Look at that hole. Give me my gun. It's time to end this motherfucker's career. Well, he didn't say it like that, but I'm sure that's what Spawn would probably say. That's what he means, you know what I mean? So Boomer's like, this cannot be happening. He runs away and Bobby's like, I don't get it. You're dreaming, now you're walking, you're alive, then you're dead and you're not. And this punk hits you in the chest and you let him run away. What's wrong with you? Are you going to do something? I'm confused. And to Spawn, the punk would be easy to kill. And Spawn is tempted to kill him, but something's happening here. Something that might threaten the filthy stench of pavement that Spawn calls his home. The alleyways. And there's the girl, the save me girl that Spawn didn't have time to save. So what's he going to do? He's going to follow the punk and see what answers he can get. But first, he uses his precious energy, his necroplasm, to fix the hole in his chest. And he chases him down, follows him. And upon getting to where the punk is destinated at, or Boomer, he finds out that it's creeps, nerds, gangs, street gangs. The plot thickens. The All of a sudden, it's revealed that the nerds and the creeps are fighting over the turf in the city. And keep in mind, this is written in the 90s, so this is kind of cheesy right now. But in terms of <laughs> gang fighting, hey, Spawn's caught in the middle of, it, middle of it. Because what Spawn realizes when this guy Boomer is getting interrogated, like nerds don't cause a scene, you're causing too much ruckus and too much attention on ourselves, you're getting sloppy over there. This guy tells him, well, I was shooting the girl and I killed the girl. Boomer tells him, I killed the girl exactly what you guys wanted me to do. But in the process, this is brother in the cape and chains and I put a hole in his chest, but he still lives. Maybe we should leave that alleyway alone. And the leader is like, nah, that alleyway will give us the corridor, the right to the heart of the creep turf. They're in the middle of it. And Spawn realizes a turf war is happening and it's in Spawn's home and he's right in the middle of it. So even though his power is depleted from fixing his chest, too many guns are down there for him to go after them. It's the wrong time to do an attack. So he learned to tell the difference back in the wars when he was a soldier. There's an important rule to war. If all you're doing is defense, then you're screwed. You have to create a situation. But first of all, you have to watch out for your buddies. So meanwhile, back in the alleyway, Boots and Billy are figuring what the hell to do with this girl. And they figure, well, we're just gonna let the cops clean it, but we gotta get the hell up out of here. So now, the creep gang comes in, tells the bums, step away from the girl. This is emotional. Well, don't mind us, says Boots and Bobby. We're just leaving. They're like, no, nah, the nerds are going to pay for this. But first, I got to show these nerds that these alleyways belong to the creeps. And I got to mark it with blood. And you fat boy, you look like you got a lot of blood in you. And guess what? He picks them up, you know, ready to make some blood in the alleyway. But Spawn blasts them in the back. Spawn tells him, sure, this is a smelly, filthy rat hole of an alley. But you know what? It's my smell smelly filthy rat hole of an alley get lost and spawn unleashes the blast power on these guys on these creeps and the creeps tell him you coming all this way in an hour of grief not showing one shred of compassion this is not so good so he blasts off on spawn and even if spawn can beat this guy there'll still be more coming from both sides and he's got to create a situation while he's dodging all these bullets coming at him and now he has a situation that he's going to create and it's easy. It's a psychological warfare. So he's going to use his necroplasm, his telekinesis, to create a situation to goad the nerds and the creeps to hate each other and go after one another in this alleyway. And very soon, 
that's what we get an all out war in the alleyway all at the leverage of these two while spawn and these bums sit back relax and kick back they don't know me like that so after all this ends byron still lives and he calls spawn out and spawns like okay big boy let's play alien i'm referencing the alien film i believe the james cameron alien film from 1979 so teleportation is what Spawn's going to do. He's going to teleport himself, being ripped from Adam Adam, living stream of energy, goes into this guy's armor, and not armor, it's five layer Kevlar with the splash of an almost nuke proof proton, heavy alloy, and it's tough to penetrate. But Spawn can teleport inside, and like Houdini, an escape artist said about a bank vault he locked himself into, it's built to keep people out but not to keep people in. It's not fun and it's not pretty and he lets it rip internally from Byron. So Bobby tells Spawn, okay, after you rip yourself off, this is kind of a trip right here, but you know, you are a boy, so I'm not gonna ask too many questions about you because I don't want you doing that same thing to me. But what I'm asking you is what about the alley? What are we gonna do? And Spawn's like, we let the cops clean it up. Then, you know, we move back in. And he tosses Byron's decapitated head down the way and life goes on. And that's where we end this issue of Spawn, issue number 10, written by Frank Miller. I thought this was a fun read, even though this is written in the 90s. You got to enjoy a little bit of a throwback on this one. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm definitely enjoying going back from Spawn, issue one, all the way up to the current run of Spawn. So I'm going to leave the playlist of Spawn, issues number one through 11 in the playlist at the end of this video if you guys want to catch up on it and binge watch on it and also the playlist in the description from spawn issue 296 all the way up to its current run because eventually we will get there on this channel so we begin this issue with spawn being drawn to the top of the church again he ponders how the devil twists people's souls and their words with his secret weapon the people's weakness to love that's how malboja convinced spawn to you know rule his army and take the hell spawn symbiote all in the name of love to see wanda again but spawn doesn't know all the answers either who killed him why why his memories come back in fragments but eventually this new spawn will have all of his answers until that day, he could only continue the struggle for some sense of order and meaning to his existence. His memory, it comes in sporadically, but some of those memories are buried deep while some surface at sporadic moments that come back to his memory. At least he accepts the notion that his life is completely out of control. The fight with Angela, the angel warrior in issue number 9, sent him to purgatory in issue number 10, which was temporarily disconnecting his powers, but when all seemed lost, within the blink, he finds himself back on earth again. But yet, he keeps getting lured back to this church sign. The only obvious connection to why he's going back to that church. And in his mind, it's because of his wedding. The only time he entered a church was when he married Wanda Blake. And that was the beautiful day in Al Simmons' life. Wanda Blake looks stunning. And it was to the point where his attention was so focused on her beauty, he forgot to say I do and just give me the kiss, give me the kiss girl. I'm ready to go on with the happily lawfully married wife and life. And how could he ever forget little Grandma Blake? Her blindness never slowed that woman down for a second, and she was feisty and ready for a granddaughter. And she pressured Al, why don't you convince Wanda to take your last name? And Al Simmons is like, well, the reason is I married Wanda Blake, not Wanda Simmons, and for her to take mom my last name, it'll sound like my sister. Well, what are you gonna do when you have children? And Al was not even thinking about that back in you know, back in the flashback. And he's like, don't worry, we got it all figured out. Instead of Blake Simmons, we're just gonna shorten it to BS, like Big BS or Little Sun BS or whatever. And even though Grandma Blake was not amused by it, well, she had to ride with it, she supported it. And Al recalls a time where he thought that he was sterile and the doctors told him that he wasn't sterile, but they never had any children together. But after his death, his best man, Terry, who was at the wedding, decided to marry Wanda Blake. And Spawn, Al Simmons feels betrayed, like how could Terry do that to me? He gave her a child, even though it's not Terry's fault, it's just, it's just a crappy feeling that Al has to deal with. So back in Washington DC in the office of Jason Wynn, his henchman tells him that their investigation showed that only a handful of personnel even had access to those files, sir. And I believe that was the issue in Spawn issue number six or seven when he fought Overkill when he went to the abandoned warehouse and took all those weapons. I think it's coming back full circle now. And the henchman tells him that their data shows that the likely suspect is Terry Fitzgerald. And the reason why is because he's heavily linked with all the facets of high priority 
third-party governmental projects as well as constant interaction with the CIA. To this point, he has kept a clean record and has been completely open to security checks. So Terry's like, what's his motive? I don't know. I'm sure you know his best friend was Lieutenant Al Simmons and he married his wife. So you remember Simmons and Jason wins like, yeah, I remember him. He was a major disappointment. Shame about his death. And that grins like, yeah, I was behind it. So whatever. So at first glance, so with all that being said, I think Terry Fitzgerald is the reason why all those weapons are going missing and people are probing when it's actually Al Simmons is doing all the probing. So Jason Wynn wants to send a message to Terry Fitzgerald. He asks his agents and his henchmen, contact a couple people in New York and have them pay a visit to Terry Fitzgerald and then rattle them up it a little bit and see what happens. It's always amusing to see which direction a scuttling weasel will run. Okay, so in this panel right here, Al Simmons disguises himself as a human or dresses up in the trench coat and a hat to visit blind Granny Blake. He says hi, and Granny Blake's like, is this really you? And she's surprised, like, oh my dear Al, this can't be you. I mean, should I get scared? And Al Simmons is like, no, please don't. I won't be long. I just came to tell you that you were right. There is an afterlife. I'm sorry I didn't believe you, and I'm so sorry I didn't heed your warnings. I've been sent to tell you that there's a place in heaven waiting for you when your day comes. The heavens will trumpet your arrival. And Granny's like, why? You, I mean, you're in heaven, so I'll, it's all good. And bless you, child. I look forward to joining you and my other friends someday in heaven. And you notice in this panel, Al does not have the guts, or how can he tell that he's not in heaven? But he tells her, Granny, I won't be there with you. Heavens for the great spirits of the world. Those who care for those who overcome great hardships. I created strife, not love. When others held out their hands to him, he walked away. God's welcome believers, not doubters. And Al Simmons does establish that he didn't believe in God in previous issues. And Granny Blake is being compassionate right now, telling him, Al Simmons, listen to me, boy. You are a hero. You understand? Everyone always told me. I don't know why you're so confused, but God didn't send you down here just to tell me I'm going to heaven. That don't make no sense. It ain't no way Satan's going to send you down here just to tell me that I'm going to heaven. So listen to me, Al. I love you very much. You made me laugh like no one else. I miss you. And of course, Wanda, since you're watching over her and where you're at, she's doing well with her new husband and her daughter, Cyan. And Spawn or Al ask her, you know, I have to ask you some questions because this is a really cool character moment for Al Simmons. Does Wanda still think of me? Oh my God, says Granny Blake. That woman still loves you and she misses you more than ever. You gave her happiness out and love that no one can take that away from her. Terry's a good guy, but she thinks about you all the time. And Al walks away knowing that he has that comfort and that closure right there. So meanwhile, in New York City's 12th precinct, NYPD Police Department, Sam and Twitch are getting, <laughs> they can't believe this crap. They're getting suspended or under internal investigation affairs because of what happened to Billy Kincaid in issue number five. The chief thinks it's them and IA is investigating them to see what happens. And Sam's like, look, even though we didn't do it, but that son of a bitch, Billy Kincaid, deserves to have ice cream scoops and sticks stuck up his ass. And we know they didn't do it, but that's pretty much what's going on in this panel right here and also let's not forget after sam and twitch saw spawn briefly in issue number five they realized well while we're on probation our internal affairs is on our asses about this how about we looked into that kate crusader who was on that scene and that gets him on the trail to follow and look into spawn and this panel right here the sun is shining bright and it's wanda blake walking her daughter cyan so pretty much what's happening in this panel here is it's establishing cyan doesn't know how to say yes yet when she says no there's chances are she means yes do you like the day no do you mean yes chess she says chess instead of yes because she can't say yes yet so when terry comes in it's a cute moment that build up here but what really is the point of this panel right here is to build up the family dynamic with terry wanda and cyan so that way when the cia agents or the henchmen come over they tell terry beautiful family you have there mr fitzgerald it is sure be a shame to see something happen to him real shame so they deliver the threat per jason's wins request and he's having a field day with that so now they sit back and have terry get followed to see what he does next because they're on to him even though terry's innocent they're on to him now we go into a few panels right here where al sim is getting drunk with the bums in the alleyway as a way of male bonding because that's what we do you know liquor and food brings the boys together Ahoo! 
But Gara being drunk and telling stories, not noticing, well, he notices that Al Simmons' symbiote face mask is on the floor, so he puts it on. But as he puts it on and starts telling his joke, the symbiote crushes him and he cannot breathe. Ow! He can't breathe! Help me! That damn mask is trying to suffocate me! So Spawn goes into the rescue, and after he removes the symbiote mask from his head, Spawn tells him, Gar, are you okay? I'm sorry, but I don't have any control over this. You have to believe me. And Gar I was like, it's all good. I mean, that mask, I might have almost died, but it beats uh, smelling old Jurassic fart, Bobby's farts, you know? So it's just this little stupid sense of humor, just as a way of bringing levity to him almost dying, you know? So we get to know more about the symbiote, and Spawn says, look, I'm sorry about this, but I have to tell you this. This is not funny. None of it is. I can't contain that Costin's movement when it perceives an enemy it makes its own choices like why did I attack you I don't know it may consider you a hostile threat but don't ask I don't have a clue how to use this thing and yet for some reason I feel like I need this outfit so spawn feeling guilty about this he walks away demanding to be left alone then suddenly Al's mind explodes he believes it's the alcohol but it's not then suddenly the picture becomes clear he had a thought of a coffin a reminder of his death in a way it was but it was also so much more the flag is the missing piece of the puzzle and the skull is signifies death not the grim reaper has his instincts were telling him but the face of a killer he sees the face of death springing forth like an evil weed to choke off things around it then suddenly finally it ate it all makes sense to him the flag didn't signify patriotism it was the killer's employer the face of death was nothing more than a mask or specifically makeup and the final piece it now seems so damn obvious it was the church it wasn't his wedding why the church has been why he was gravitating towards the church it's his name it wasn't a church it's chapel spawn al simmons killer and that's where we end this issue of spawn issue number 12 what you guys think of the comic book comment below let me know link in the description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection support the art support the industry also don't forget to check out ratedcomics.com for some really cool comics and some rated comics exclusives as well we begin this issue with Al Simmons recalling in time that he was playing baseball and how he broke his ankle and being next to Wanda that's all he can remember was how beautiful she was and how they made love until the sun came up in the next morning and how she made him feel. Personally I think this is a callback to when Todd McFarlane used to play baseball and this is a little bit of Todd McFarlane inside the character spawn how he resonates with them. Now in this panel right here we're at Young Blood Headquarters where Bad Rock is on guard duty playing video games. And if you're not familiar with Young Bloods, it's a comic book series within Image Comics. I have not checked it out, I just know that's what the text is saying over here. But at that time Spawn is recalling his friend Chapel, recalling the time he killed him. Yeah, Chapel killed Spawn, that's Spawn's killers. He here is being recruited into this Young Blood program. So Spawn checked in and at the Young Blood Headquarters this place is rigged with a heat sensor that detects anything remote remotely human because spawn is not remotely human it doesn't detect him so he's been sitting there waiting there waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike chapel and get down with the get down but in the meantime he recalls and tells the little remembrance that he has with chapel death is all that they have in common and woman because chapel he loves his one night stands he has no one that he cares about no family no friends but that's what Chapel loves. And the longer that Al Simmons waits in that young blood headquarters room, he finds it harder to hate, to stay motivated to kill Chapel, to do some damage to Chapel. But he reminds himself that the love he had for Wanda and how Chapel took that away from him. So, how does he hate? Well, some people can hate but not be angry, and some people can be angry and not hate. It takes a very evil person to make you combine the two. And Chapel has become that, and now Spawn is motivated for the showdown. And the thing is, if Chapel can kill a friend, everything else is easy and enjoyable. And we see Chapel in this training session duking out with droid robots. Shaft, their team leader of the Young Blood, comes in, tells him to calm down. Hey, it's time to get everyone together for this team meeting. And Chapel's like, Not me, baby. You guys can quit if you want to. I'm just getting warmed up. And Spawn just further motivates his incentive to kill Chapel down the hallway. He's still as cocky as ever. Good. I didn't want this to be easy. Because with my powers, I can't lose no matter what happens in the next few hours I've got the winning hand so now spawn emerges 
and just flexes as a superiority in the young blood headquarters. He spots Chapel 30 feet away, and for what, for lack of a better term, his heart does drop or skip a beat, even though. As we know, Violet removed his heart, but he's dead now. Though he wishes not to waste any more of his precious new powers, he knows he has no choice because he doesn't want Shaft, he doesn't want the other leaders, he wants strictly Chapel. And their team leader, Shaft, commands the respect of those he leads. And he's like, hey mister, don't make a move. I don't know how you get in, but you're not going to get out. And Spawn's like, make your move. Everyone freezes because they don't know who they're up against. But in this moment, Bad Rock enters the room like, hey, yo, dudes, what's up? Some trip the alarm. Anyways, it's kind of a stupid comedic right there. But he's thinking Spawn is another recruit. So Spawn's like, nah, man, enough time with this. He lifts his hands and gestures ever so slowly like a modern day Dracula. Because he morphed into size and he's shrinking and twisting, radiating any colors of greenish and blue until he's completely gone, gone from their sight. Him and Chapel go away and they don't know where they're at. So Shaft tells it to either lift them up, sweep the complex, search for signs of other security breaches. If it's not clear, notify headquarters. I've just reassigned our unit. This is priority one. Check the databases. We got to get a move on this thing. So in this panel right here, it's late night for Terry Fitzgerald and Wanda and their daughter Cyan in their New York neighborhood. As an agent of the United States Security Group, Terry always faced the possibility of danger. He distanced himself from that side of things years ago when he shifted over to its intercultural liaison unit. After what happened to Al, he needed a break from the front line of activity. Plus, you know, the man has a family now. But this morning's threats from the previous issue, he knows the security group doesn't muscle its own unless they have something very serious on him. And for the life of him, he can't imagine what that would be. Wanda wakes up and tells him to go back to bed. He can't, unfortunately, so he goes to check on his child. She asks him, is it something to talk about? And he can't. But she knew that when she chose to be with him, there's some parts of his line of work work that he has to keep secret and he's not ready to release that to her and he, she's okay with that so he gazes over his daughter's innocent face and he wonders how much time is left before she learns the cruelty that people do to each other on this world in this panel right here we see detective sam brick is just finishing a miserable day of work in the field hearing complaints of concerned citizens in this case it's an elderly lady telling sam how she stabbed her husband in the ass cheek so to speak it's a weird story but twitch comes in and their investigation is almost complete and if everything goes well they should be back on the streets in terms of doing their duties fiduciary cop duties by thursday and if we're acquitted we're back on the streets and all is good baby and sam's like good thank you twitch because i'm going to find our little red hero that day spawn even though he doesn't know that his name is spawn he knows they gotta find spawn and let him know what they've been going through because they saw spawn in spawn issue number five when he killed billy king so now back into the action nearly eight thousand miles from the young blood headquarters lies a certain swamp in botswana a green mist swamp Worlds there visibly taking form they show up and chapel's like where the hell are we boy and spawns like surely you haven't forgotten about this place and chapel's like man i don't pay attention to any landscape when i'm working exactly says spawn you never give a damn about anything that crossed your path even your so-called friends and Spawn's trying to give him remembrance like, yo, this is Al by giving him clues. And Chapel's like, I ain't trying to hear all that shit. Buddy, you don't know a damn thing about me. Not a goddamn thing. If we're here to fight, then let's get it on. And Spawn's like, uh, okay, I see. Always a tough guy, eh? I've forgotten how deep your arrogance can be. Everything I am, you gave to me in a roundabout way. The devil didn't make me, you did. He only took advantage of me after I was dead. As for fighting, you damn right we're gonna fight. And by the way, your signal device, I've scrambled your signal so your friends won't be helping you today. Spawn removes his cape in preparation for battle and Chapel goes in and Spawn's like, I ain't disappointed, I love this. And he clobbers him with the right hook. You haven't been listening, boy. You killed me, you stole everything from me and don't you remember it? And Chapel flies back. Look at what you've made. He takes off his symbiote mask, hoping that Chapel will remember or recognize that it was Al. I thought we were the same and we loved our country. But friends, you don't slaughter your friends. It was the enemy we're after that day. But I guess I made a fatal mistake in trusting you. And Chapel's like, you're crazy. That's for sure. It's going to be a pleasure breaking your scrawny little neck. And let's end this now. You haven't changed at all in the years, says Spawn. Not at all. So full of yourself. Always did think you were the best. Even with the ladies, isn't that right? He 
there's a callback right here remember the Don Juan of killers if you don't remember that's what spawn calls chapel when he was alive the Don Juan of the ladies now he's the Don Juan of killers and that opens up chapel's eyes and he remembers a flashback elsewhere in past events where him and Jason Wynn were in the room. Jason Wynn gave Chapel the order to eliminate Simmons. Why? Because even though he's a friend, Jason Wynn tells Chapel that Spawn was flagged as a spy for their enemies and his orders were to eliminate Al. And Chapel was one of them kind of brothers that uh, he doesn't question the order, he just does it. And he verified nothing and that's what pissed Spawn off. So who's better to kill a security problem than an obedient puppet? And that's Chapel. For Chapel, it was all about getting the job done. And when the time came, he loaded his laser pick, walked up to Al because he had the ability to get close to Al because they were friends once upon a time and blast his brains to a crisp. And Chapel's like, you're not real. You can't be back in present time. And he clobber spawn. It must be Geiger messing with me. Always throwing me some illusions or trickery at me. But to use you, Simmons? Oh, that's a good one. And he tries to drown Simmons in the water like, you got your own problems now, I'm gonna kill you. And Spawn's like, look, I'm not dead enough and you can't kill me. I got the upper hand here. And as he, you know, gets the upper hand and tosses his ass to the side, Chapel's like, maybe it's you, maybe it's not. But I never could stomach your whining and bitching all the time, trying to fix everything. You always wear the goody two shoes. You screwed everything, but damn you, it was me who took the serum, not you. I'm the one poisoned with HIV. I'm imagining that's like superhuman strength or something. So screw your sob story. Not realizing this, Chapel doesn't know that human weapons don't hurt Spawn. And Al Simmons is like, how pitiful you've become. I didn't take the serum because Wanda and I were trying to conceive. So you believe what you want. I don't care. He takes out the blade, but it is me back from the dead with more power than I need, but little else. You don't scare me, says Chapel. I killed you once, I could do it again. And Spawn's like, wrong. I'm the one in position to kill. You'll be dead if that's what I wanted, but it's not. You see, Chapel, when I died, friends and family mourned my loss. My death caused a lot of sadness. But if I kill you, no one will give a damn. You don't have any friends or family who would shed a single tear. Only thing you ever care about was that one night, poom, poom, chump, chump, stamp, mm. Just a bunch of whores you didn't give a damn about the next day. That's all you got and that's all you'll ever have. Well, I could fix that. So Spawn uses his power, time to even the score and Chapel screams in pain and Spawn gives him back his tracker. Here, it works now. Your pal should be able to find you from now. I want you to see how tough you really are to see if you can really keep this war on a personal level. Bye, bitch. Eight hours later, young bloods go up into the island and look for Chapel. What happened? You see the guy in the red cape? What happened? What, what went down over here? And all Chapel can do is say nothing as Spawn branded his face in the form of a skull. And Chapel's just pissed, but this is a brutal ending. And that's where we end this issue, this review of Spawn, issue number 13. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know. Link in the description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection. Support the art support the industry. Alright, so we begin this issue off with Violator telling some young boys about himself and the feats he has achieved so far in his life. These feats include our taking orders from other people while having no moral code of his own. He brags about how bigger and how much he is greater than what he presents himself to be. It's the clown being the clown and just talking smack, I mean just embellishing a little bit. And the boys have had enough of it. And one of them even says that if they wanted to hear stories, then they will go to the movies instead. Violator gets pissed about hearing that comic. He's like, hey man, I gave you guys the courtesy of hearing about your heroes. I only asked for a few moments to listen up to my adventures. No time for anyone but yourselves, huh? His face goes dark as he says he should end all the kids at that moment right then, right now. But in hindsight, he likes their attitude. It kind of reminds him of himself. The Violator does something unthinkable. He gives them money to make him listen, which immediately shocks them all. After all, the Violator begins to start his story. And the story starts like this. And keep in mind, this is a telemedieval spawn right here. 800 years ago, there was an evil wizard named Spawn Wizard, and his soul was as dark as coal. He gutted many innocent folks, men, women, even babies, few were immune to his barbaric ways. He kept the people in check by using the strongest force on earth. Here you go. This is the force. 
money, not the Star Wars force you're thinking about. If you read enough Spawn or watch this channel, you know this story is horse crap. Medieval Spawn is who the Violator is referencing as Spawn Wizard, and he is in fact a hero. But we're going to let the clown be the clown for the sake of the story, okay? All the people living on that land feared the wizard, and upon mention of him, goosebumps would go all over their bodies. After all, he was decisive and ruthless. He used to kill armies of men in a matter of minutes, and that was to half of his potential. The kids asked the clown mid-story why nobody aced the guy. Other kids chimed in like maybe they were chicken or maybe they had no guts whatsoever. Then the violator says he was handpicked by his boss to bring this beast down. When the people met him, he says they welcomed him with open arms. He accepted his assignment without any hesitation whatsoever. In actuality, the violent went on a murderous speed because that is exactly who he is. Something consistent about the story and probably true to his character. They wanted him to eliminate this wizard who spreads chaos and abyss everywhere he goes. But the Violator not only did he want to take out the wizard, he's going to take out the people too because that's who he is. The Violator says he was the perfect antidote for this wizard because he would head around surrounding villages with the Violator's presence. People no longer have to fear Spawn Wizard. He wanted to assure those people personally that he was now their sworn protector. He tells the boys he encountered a man who survived Spawn Wizard's attack. But the Violet ensured he was dead because what good are unfinished wounds and it's the Violet being a Violet. He's going to eliminate them. Now that is who he is. We just got to remind ourselves that. Now the Violet continued that he had to go in with the strategy that would take the Spawn Wizard by surprise. He had to strengthen himself hone his abilities he's got to build himself up now and i'm thinking over here these creed and rocky montages since i was sick over the weekend i was watching some of those creed and rocky movies it was kind of that's what it's kind of reminding me of a little rocky moment here and he can't just rush into it things will go wrong for him if he does that instantly he needs a decoy he needed a decoy someone that even the most disgusting of human beings actually cared for and he found her the wizard's very own wicked faced witch mother the boys then question clown like if you're 800 years old hold up who is your boss he's got to be pretty powerful to keep you alive the violator says to reference the bible if they read it and not the good side of the bible the story then switches to New York City Police Department, the 12th Precinct, where we see Detective Sam Burke and Twitch Williams celebrating that they've been cleared of any wrongdoing in the death of child murderer Billy Kincaid. The pair look to return to keeping New York City safe. The two of them decide that the next course of action for them would be to locate Spawn, because in Spawn issue number 5, they know they didn't kill Billy Kincaid like the Precinct did, but they saw that Spawn was there, but they had no evidence or no proof of it, and they're out to clear their name or at least to give them their own peace of mind. Now Sam and Twitch go to an alleyway to find Spawn as Spawn decides what to do with Chap. Even though he had his revenge on him in Spawn issue number 13, he could still rat out Spawn if he likes. Now you can check out Spawn issue 13 to see what Spawn did to him as punishment. Spawn asks himself, does he just sit this out and wait for Chapel to open his mouth? He concludes, well you know what, time is still on his side. As Sam and Twitch do their own interrogation in the alleyways on the whereabouts of Spawn, Spawn is lost in thought, turns the corner of the long alleyway, he quickly snaps back into reality and decides to wander aimlessly elsewhere. Because in that moment, it makes no sense in that moment to confront the two detectives at that given time. They notice the tip of his cloak and when they go to track him down, the brother is gone, just like that. In this panel right here, the Violator resumes his part of the story that he went after Spawn Wizard's wicked mother, witch mother at that, to get to him, and she don't look wicked or witch at all. Mm -hmm. Clown claims that she was 100% evil. The sight of her will make you scream. Mm. And fangs grew on the back of her lips. Yo, man, stop the cap. Stop the cap. It took him three days to reach her castle, and once he did get there, he immediately tries to attack her as the mother asked for mercy. The mercy part, of course, wasn't told to the boys, at least not in accuracy at, at, at that moment, but Clown tells the boys that it was a legendary fight. Maybe legendary on his end, but not on the mother's end. The mother was captured, and a message was sent to Spawn Wizard that his mother had been captured and to throw down, meet down if you want to get your mother back. 
Now Spawn Wizard immediately came after the Violator and looked to free his mother. He tried to reach his mother, but the Violator became an obstacle and they had to do it down. So face me with honor, you devil's toy, says Spawn Wizard, or more so known as a medieval Spawn, cause come on now, I know why you've been sent here. Your master wishes to test me to see if I'm a fit for his army. You tell your master that I will not be scared by the likes of you. We are both pawns in this eternal war with heaven, but I will not be toyed with. Thus began the battle between good and evil, Spawn versus the Violator. After battling out for a while, the Violator questions him if he ever gets tired, you know, just to mock him and, you know, mess with him a little bit. But Spawn doesn't stop to answer and keeps attacking him either way. Even though Violator says that he had Spawn on the ropes due to his fierce attacks, we're clearly showing something different when the horse kicks him, kicks the Violator in the back. At some point during the fight, the Violator lost track of him. He vanished into the forest. He saw that his wicked but fine ass mother was still tied to the tree. He knew he had to return. So he went as soon as our boy, but not the Violator's boy, our boy, your boy, the reader's boy, surfaced again before he can launch his attack. As a counter, the Violator attacked with flames coming out of his mouth. Spawn went down and he was completely burnt from head to toe. He kept doing that for 10 minutes as his mother watched in horror. The mother could not believe what she was seeing. After he stopped blowing flames from his mouth, he could see Spawn's armor glowing red hot. The boys get uneasy and they can't wait any longer. They gotta go home, they're hungry, you know, bedtime, whatever the case. They just, they, the story's taking too long to get to the point. So the Violator hands him another five dollars each and tells him what he saw. He says he saw that the Spawn was wholly disintegrated with those flames. He saw Dilly squat, nada, zero zip, nada. The spawn wasn't there anymore, and the mother couldn't do anything but look at the whole scene in horror. The spawn wizard was dead, and the violator had won the showdown between the two. There stood the violator after his victory, laughing. Okay, look, what you guys think about this unbelievable tale of medieval spawn told by the violator himself? Comment below, let me know. Sounds kind of weird, but just stick with me to the end of the video regarding that video title. So we continue the story from our last issue where the Violator tells a group of young boys how he annihilated Spawn Wizard, Medieval Spawn. So whenever I say Spawn Wizard, just know that it's Medieval Spawn for the sake of storytelling because that's what Violator is calling him. So Violator tells the group of boys that he annihilated Spawn Wizard when he started releasing flames from his mouth. And once that happened, Spawn Wizard was incinerated and was nowhere to be found. The fact is that this wasn't the true story that the Violator told the boys. So the reason why the Violator was telling the false story was because on his last mission, the Violator's orders were to provoke Spawn, pick a fight with Spawn, and now we're talking about Al Simmons Spawn, and force him to use or experiment with this power so Spawn's power meter will go down to zero. It would result in his second death quicker. That's what Bolger wanted because when Spawn's power meter goes down to zero, second death goes to hell, take over my army son. So Violator decided to attack the mob and go on a killing spree by removing their hearts. He hoped it would spawn a three-way attack on spawn with the mob and the police department. Police department, mob, and spawn all in the triangle attack. He figured with all those attacks, it would fuel more souls for hell. In actuality, the opposite happened. Violence and killing slowed down and that pissed off Malboja because for evil to prosper, Violence and death must take place, and Violator's action put those events on pause. So, as an act of redemption, if you will, Violator wants to boast himself up to those kids, and they get inspired. He thinks it'll earn himself back in the good graces of his boss. The boys were kind of impressed with them, but at the same time, after he spilled all the details, then they were not impressed with them. The Violator continues that he had to poke around to know Spawn was dead and he wasn't pretending. Now we're going back into storytelling mode. His body isn't there anymore, which convinces the Violator that Spawn Wizard is no more. The Violator then moves in to get rid of the Mother Witch for good. Keep in mind, that's fine Mother Witch. You know, you get the gist of the story that it's just not true, but we're going to go with it. So Mother Witch, she begs the Violator to stop doing what he's doing, but the Violator feels something is wrong. 
He felt it, but couldn't put his finger quite on it. He then proceeds to cut the mother's cheek with this claw. Now from nowhere, we see Spawn Wizard cut off the Violator's finger and threatens him. Silent attack style that screams, I got you sucker. Now how did he even consider putting his finger on the maiden's face like that? Then again, it is the Violator, and all he does is he just violates. Spawn Wizard then proceeds to attack the Violator with this sword, as he brags that the maiden is everything good that has ever happened to him. And bringing her pain is one of the biggest mistakes the Violator has ever made. Spawn Wizard tells the Violator to tell his master that he will never be his puppet. Even though he tried many times to acquire Spawn Wizard services, it has yet to happen in the past and will never happen in the coming time either. So Violator tells the kids that their epic battle continues with their superior skills and that he was quickly able to overcome the witch. <laughs> the fine witch I should add. He had to overcome her spells and all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah, 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 all that kind of bull jive, right? Violator picks up an entire tree and swings at Spawn Wizard. He misses, he gets out of harm's way. Violator claims he doesn't know how much longer he can last in his fight. He claims to withstand blow after blow to talk about their epic standoff. Spawn Wizard continues to slice away the Violator using the sword as his claws seem to have no impact. Breathing fire at him was the only type of attack that he hadn't tried on him yet. He had to be careful though when to do it because the Violator needs the Spawn Wizard to be closer for the flames to be effective. All the fire attack did was burn the symbiote on the surface but not the flesh underneath and this Hell Spawn still got some fight in him. So the tide shifted in favor of Spawn Wizard as the Violator could not get an opening. We get to know that the story told by the Violator to the boys is obviously false. I'm just going to reiterate that, but for the sake of storytelling, we're just going to go with it. So as the Violator was the one who destroyed all those villages and preyed on those flesh children, just reminding you of all that if you've forgotten or didn't watch Spawn issue number 14 video, check that out. So when Violator has a Spawn Wizard in a position where Violator is about to get the upper hand, Spawn Wizard asks, what kind kind of monster eats the hearts of children. The Violator dies into greedy details of how the hearts of adults are much tastier than children's. Children's hearts are not nearly as ripe, and Spawn Wizard gets pissed. Suddenly, the Violator finds an opening for himself and breathes Spire on Spawn again. What we see next is nothing short of comic book gangster in pure art form. Emphasis on the nests for sweetness. So as the Violator breathes fire on Spawn Wizard, his chain and cape return. The Violator is stunned because he cannot believe that this is happening to him. The Maiden cries out, noting that the chain and cape have returned. Spawn addresses her by saying that this is the extent of his power which his enemies do not know about. Spawn Wizard then tells the Violator to prepare for death because that is the only thing that will save him from Spawn Wizard. So he chops up the Violator's head, screaming that he will return him to hell. Now we're going to take a moment and just enjoy this panel right here. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel if you're liking the content so far. So as Spawn Wizard frees the Maiden, he tries to calm her down, telling her that he only did this to protect her. The Maiden is freaked out by looking at Spawn's appearance, and she tells him to get away from her. He has ended up losing the love of his life. It is a sad moment. Even after he begs her to stay, it doesn't matter matter to her. She has to go. She can't stand it. Violator claims that he was the first dragon. It's not the name he gave himself and he doesn't know why he was colored green, but that's how showbiz is. He's not complaining. So the Violator returns to his master, Malboja, and even though he didn't manage to kill the spawn wizard, it seems he has done an admirable job since he made him lose the love of his life. So the story moves into the present day where the boys are bored with the Violator's story and throw a newspaper at his face. As he takes it off, he's ready to you know, end their careers right there, so to speak. He reads the headline mentioning Vito Gravano being involved in some killings, and the Violator knows he made those killings. So he decides to visit Gravano by himself. Ain't no way he's taking credit for all those kills. So in this panel right here, we then see Spawn being beaten up by a man in an alleyway. It starts out of nowhere because Spawn is doing nothing but just sleeping, just resting his eyes. The man starts beating up Spawn, and even though he is much larger than Spawn, and a lot more human too, he isn't sparing him one bit. Spawn then decides to teach this boy a lesson. He shows his feats of strength in his body can pull and tells the guy that he didn't want to do this, but he left him no choice. Spawn could have ended his life within a minute 
actually more like within a second, but chose not to. Spawn then decides that it's time he gives out a loud signal, a loud shout out, so that people don't disturb him or his territory. This is Spawn's territory, he states. So in this panel right here, in Queens, Terry Fitzgerald lays awake, terrified as the Moz men have threatened his family again, and he doesn't know what to do. They have a dirty job for him, and someone's got to do it. If he don't do it, these people know how to inflict pain that words cannot describe. They hang up the phone. It'll be nearly 20 minutes before Terry moves, and another 40 minutes before he stops sweating. What do you guys think of this issue? Comment below, let me know. And also, if you'd like to add some Spawn comics and or some of our rated comics exclusives or other comics to your comic book collection, check out the links in the description. Support the art, support the industry. Between you and me, I'm not really a big fan of Spawn issue 14 and 15, but then again, I didn't have a bad time reading it either, so. Uh, you know, it was cool to me. It wasn't nothing that gets me over the top. But at the same time, I'm not disappointed that I read these two issues either. So we begin this issue in Simmonsville, where these two volunteers are walking around. They compare this place, Simmonsville, like Disneyland. Why do they compare it like Disneyland? Because according to them, nothing around this place makes sense. Like there's a church near the water slide and a factory in the middle of a park, but it just doesn't make sense to them, but they're all geared up and ready to shoot something. So now that there's something incoming, something emerges from the ground, and guess what? In Simmonsville, they're in their own little piece of hell on earth. These violators emerge from the ground and they go to work on them, but we all know that these violators are gonna go to work on these brothers right here. So the deal with Simmonsville is it happened over five years ago. Jason Wynn explains this to Majorville. It was a routine ground A bomb test that happened in Nevada. It opened a hole into what they thought was another dimension. And that other dimension turned out to be hell. So they stumbled onto a doorway to hell. So they sent in an armed task force and they were never seen again. But one thing they did find out though is that hell is composed of a substance called psychoplasm. And psychoplasm is a material of a substance that it's unknown in the physical world. But whatever you're thinking of, that's what psychoplasm does. Whatever you're thinking of, whatever you desire or your fear, psychoplasm becomes that very thing. Think of like Pennywise and it manifesting your fears, but it's psychoplasm without the freaking clown doing his thing. Jason Wing preaches to Major Vell, just imagine what it would mean to the US military if they possess psychoplasm and they're able to gain control of such substance to their enemies, which brings Jason Wynn to Al Simmons. He talks about Al Simmons to Major Val that Simmons was a good man, one of their best soldiers that he's ever trained, but he had to expand him because he's gotten soft. And Jason Wynn continues to tell Major Val that the presences in hell, that he contacted one of the presences and made a deal with it. The deal was in exchange for Simmons, hell will give Wynn access to the psychoplasm. So the town you're looking at, Major Val, the two unfortunate volunteers are currently facing their worst fears right now, and it's entirely out of psychoplasm. So when they sent Simmons to hell, they stole his memories, and those memories are acted upon raw psychoplasm created Simmonsville. That's what happened. So a fake town built from the jumble of one man's recollections. That's Simmons. So this is where they've been conducting their research major. That's what Jason would continue telling Major Val that this is what you want to see. So are you interested? And Major Val's like, man, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. I can't deny it with my own eyes what I saw, but and as all this blood is splurting out from the chimney, I don't know if I'm able to take this up to the board. So Jason wins like, look, I know it's a little overwhelming. I can understand that. So I want to do my workout. And when I'm done in an hour or two, let's reconjoin with this and see what you come to. Does that sound good? Major Val agrees. So cut to New York City, Spawn begins questions. And with all these questions, there's an answer. But with those answers, begets more questions. Things used to make sense to Al, but now they're just getting crazier, like plots, deals, heaven and hell, angels and demons running loose on the streets of New York. And who is he? He asked himself, who is he? He was once Al Simmons, but he got shafted and got sent straight to hell after he got assassinated. 
He made a deal with the devil, and he got shafted all over again. Talk about on both ends. You getting it in, bro, in the wrong kind of way. Story of his freaking life. And now the devil gave him a soul, and he gave him a whole west of grief and pain. And now he's like feeling like he's some kind of undead freak with the face like a stale pizza and the memory that got shot straight to hell. So he's finding out more things every day, and that's Al Simmons talking in his monologue, but he still doesn't know what really happened or who he really is. Al Simmons is dead, yes. Chapel pulled the trigger, but who in the heck gave him the order to do so? Who set Al up? Who sent him to hell? And that's the questions Al Simmons is asking. And on top of that, if he's dead, how come he has a body? Since he did die, I mean, guys don't have bodies. The bodies are in the grave, right? And if I'm here, what did they bury in Al Simmons' grave? So there's only one way for him to find all that out. But first, he needs to let off a little steam. And that steam comes in the form of one of his comrades in the alleyways about to get burnt alive by these guys. They're claiming they're concerned citizens trying to do something about the homeless problem. So they call it a burn a bum scheme, don't we? And his partner's like, yeah, that's right. We gonna burn him. So get ready to burn in hell, says one of the guys. And spawns like, hell? Approaching right behind him. You really want to talk about hell right now? Then let's talk. And these guys are like, geez, guys, you're, you're the spawn dude. You spooked me. And Spawn just comes in flex. So Spawn's like, yeah, you heard him, Bernie. Go ahead, blast me away like your boy said. So Spawn grabs his hand and just squeezes it so freaking hard that this guy just vomits on the ground. And the other guy gets knocked sent back. And Spawn is pissed like, you know what? You think I need powers to deal with scum like you? Do you? Well, it was just a joke. We're not going to torture the guy. We're just having some fun. Spawn is pissed, but he's taking out his aggression on them because he's trying to find out some answers on him. So after all this is done, Spawn tells him, look, man, I'm sorry about all that. I was just feeling pissed. And the guy's like, it's all good. And Spawn leaves because he has to dig up his grave. And he tells the guy, look, if anyone comes looking for me, tell them I've gone to dig up an old friend. So not far away in Midtown Manhattan in a mirror world building with no name and no number to it, it's Terrain Affairs. And this is their headquarters and Gabriel receives a call from Control talking about Spawn who defeated Angela recently. So headquarters tells him, well, this Spawn is so special and dangerous. That's what special means. They've been empowered to create their own soldier to destroy Spawn. The balance of power must be seriously compromised if someone's prepared to intervene so directly with the affairs of earth gabriel is just like let's just hope our orbital angel station is up and running and michaela we got some work to do so the situation as it stands they have full authority to empower a human agent to destroy the hell spawn so the station gets ready and these orbital angels begin the procedure and they make contact with the avenging angel of the fifth heaven and arrange for a transfer of elemental fire so they arrange for a soldier and fearful times calls for fearful measures and they already hand selected a human that has the strength to bear the elemental fire and the subject has already been selected and the guy says we're gonna bring him up right now who is this guy they're talking about well, it's none other than Jason Wynn who's sparring with these ninjas who are also his employees. And he gets pissed because he takes them out too easily. Look, man, whatever they're paying you guys, it's too much. You fight like little freaking girls. And if I was an enemy, you'd be dead right now. And also, you're out of a job. So the Orbital Angel activates the transference. Jason Wynn goes up. He gets beamed up. And he asks, how did I get here? Who the hell are you people? Are you his people? Meaning, do they serve Malboja? And they clearly indicate, nah, bruh, we don't serve no Mount Boja. We are the servants of a higher power, and you will be our servant when we're done with you. And Jason was like, no way, you don't know who I am. And the burning sensation begins, and he starts his transformation. So we go to Al Simmons' grave, where he goes to his own grave to see what this is all about. He pulls back the lid of his coffin to see what's inside. All he can say is, no. The smell is like some sick ancient thing breathing in his face. It's him. And he doesn't know who he is as he holds his body. What am I, he says. What have you done to me? So back to Jason Wynn, their work is accomplished, and they tell him the elements of fire of heaven burns within you. You are no longer living, no longer human. Rise up, 
be born again soldier you're the soldier of the light you are the anti-spawn and that is the end of this issue yo this is a key issue because i believe this is the first appearance of redeemer the anti-spawn so for those of you that are key issue collectors and like to add key issues to your combo collection you can't go wrong with this one also link in description if you wish to add any of our other comic books or some of our rated comics exclusives to your comic book collection I thought the issue was pretty good. I thought I was fine. Could I think it could have been better? Of course, of course. But you know what? Hey, we got to just keep pushing and shoving because it's spawn, baby. That's what we do around here. So we begin this issue where somewhere in time there is laughter. Malboja is mocking his as he surveys the work that he's done and he declares it good. As he gazes down upon the man he condemned to the unliving hell, that's Al Simmons. And he laughs and mocks as Al Simmons is trying to seek the more truth to what happened. And he mocks and laughs as Spawn learned that the body he currently wears is not his earthly body, which lies decaying in his grave, as Al Simmons recently discovered when he tried to discover his own grave. So Malboja takes him on a journey, and because they're in a spirit realm, Spawn says he hears a voice in his head that he can never forget, and it's like fingernails grating on the blackboard. And he feels this cold hand surrounding him, and it takes him to a place. And and where Malboja takes him to is this place. It's a realm and a gateway to hell. It's a portal that occupies part of the military testing ground in Nevada, and it's what they call, you know, Simmonsville, referencing from the last issue. So Malboja explains that hell is built up of a substance that your people have taken from us, calling it the psychoplasm. But little does Al know that psychoplasm was the exchange for Al Simmons. And what psychoplasm does is it is it adapts itself to human thoughts and fears. So when you died, Al, psychoplasm acted upon your memories. Just as your new spawn body is composed of psychoplasm, it can change its shape. So too can this gateway to assume the forms of any thoughts or emotions imprinted upon it. So Malboja takes Al Simmons back to a time and he asks him, do you remember the day when you and Wanda were on the lake and you bent your knee and begged Wanda to marry you? <laughs> How touching, he mocks him again. Not your wife, just a stray memory given to a flesh. But how such memories must sting when you think of her in the arms of another man. Oh, I delight in your sadness, little hell spawn. Each day you are more my slave. It will not be long before you crawl towards my throne and take my place in my army. Well, actually not take his place, but take Spawn's place in his army. So somewhere in time in the Angel Orbital Station, the soldier is ready. These orbital angels are preparing their anti-spawn and they prepare to dispatch him into Earth and they pray for a swift kill. So there is a brief sound like a choir catching its breath and a silver white comet explodes down through the upper atmosphere. Spawn, he's going through this turmoil of what Mount Boaz is showing and mocking and feeling like you took my soul. Where are you, bastard? Where are you? He feels Kills Malboja in the spirit, but not in the physical. So this impact of an anti-spawn redeemer lands. Spawn is like, I don't know what the hell that is, but my skin is crawling with static. There's something more. There's something there. What is it? Oh, it is something bad, all right. And as Redeemer talking about hell spawn, I'm come for you. And it's time to get down with the get down. But before we get down with the get, then we gotta take it back to Wanda Blake and Terry. And on CNN, this reporter talks about that. Meanwhile, in Washington, government sources are refusing to confirm or deny rumors about the disappearance of controversial president advisor Jason Wynn. Jason Wynn was scheduled to appear in a live television debate early, but keep in mind, in the previous issue, Wynn was abducted by the orbital station because he was selected to be their new redeemer or anti-spawn. So Wanda Blake is watching this and is like, are they talking about Al? And he's like, no, not really. So he changes the channel. They're just talking about Jason Wynn and I'm pretty sure it's not something you want to hear about. So Wanda tells Terry that, you know, she never liked Wynn. And Wanda tells Terry that when Jason Wynn came around when her and Al were married, he always gave her the creeps. So Terry comforts Wanda and tells her that Jason was involved in a lot of bad stuff, but he always managed to keep his nose clean. So he's reaffirming that your feelings, your suspicions about him, they were correct. So Wanda is just like, you know, it really doesn't matter anymore because it's not like we don't know where Jason Wynn's at and if he's vanished off the face of the earth, it doesn't matter no more. So my mind is on you. It's not on Al. Let's keep this going. Let's keep this relationship going. 
Little does she know that for Jason Wynn, he has been reborn as the anti-spawn and stands face to face with his old adversary, Al Simmons. Though, neither man suspects it. They just come, they just want to take each other's head off. So anti-spawn blasts away and knocks Al Simmons back. So whatever he throws at him, it hits Spawn like a freight train. It feels like something inside him just caught fire like hot glass and acid in his veins. Everything spins and a wall comes up behind him colors as he goes through a church window he's in pain he's in agony lightning crackling down his nervous systems he can smell incense and old wood and it hurts him real bad this is a church that did he marry wanda in? is this all going through his head but no it's not a church that he married wanda in it's just a church he happens to be in these other demons in are like ha, ha, ha. look what we have here it's the hell spawn it smells like the hell spawn it's the hell spawn all right not so high and mighty now is he so as they come in and ready to take his symbiote off of him well you know they're not going to enjoy that because for one they smell opportunity in the road to let's get us let's get a symbiote suit right now before the great malboja but at the same time anti-spawn comes in like stand away from him he's mine and he blasts him away and incinerates him it's a stink of burning meat and sulfur who is this guy as a spawn he's never faced anything with so much raw power before and what if he's stronger than spawn and how come he feels like he knows who this guy is well, that's because you do know who this guy is, but you really don't know. But you get that feeling like I've met him before because you have. But it makes it all the more interesting. So anti-spawn says, see, see how the holy burning light of heaven dispels the darkness. Now you hell spawn. I'll make you scream. Now, before we go into the screaming part, we get this part of Simmonsville going down in flames. And Mayor Val is just like, you know, we cannot let this go up in flames. And I believe this is a symbolism of what's going on with spawn right now. How he feels like his world is just crashing crashing down and burning in front of him right now as he fights his agent anti-spawn or the redeemer he wants to save the program because it means too much the government to let it go all out to manifest the fears of your enemies and use that to your advantage that is one powerful weapon that they're not gonna they're not just gonna let that go so back to spawn duking it out with the redeemer he can't take much more of this pain and he's got to try to take him out so as he regroups himself blasts off away well turns well he has every intention on hitting him but he missed and he's still coming after him the next blast if spawn were to take another blast from him it will kill him and he's got to get out of here so what he does is he teleports and it's kind of like a switch that just snaps in his brain so as he dissolves his body as he describes how he's the feeling of being teleported everything falls inward like a collapsing balloon the world breaks up and goes out and he's traveling like a shotgun blast through unspace at the speed of light stress molecules with shrieking with shock kind of painful how you describe all that but spawn is like you know i'm never gonna believe anything i see on star wars again teleportation hurts and it hurts bad He's kind of drawn to this place he calls home, the alleyways. As he makes impact or makes his arrival be known, he tells his comrades to get away. All of you, he might be able to follow, just get away. And they're happy to see him. like, it's the Spawn, what's up big boy, how you doing? And Spawn's like, no, I ain't trying to have no time for no meet and greet, just go, get out of here. But as it turns out, anti-Spawn teleports too, and Spawn's like, it can't be. He can't have come after me so soon, I need more time. And in Redeemer, anti-spawn comes out like you can't hide boy i could track you through time and space to the ends of the earth there's nowhere to run from death and he blasts him again and it gets to the point upon the impact spawns like man i can't see straight everything is broken up inside is that blood in my eyes or what is it and it's this costume coming alive bleeding and moaning and He's just in so much pain. anti spawns like, don't you understand the pain? Burning aside, white fire, they set light to my soul. If I kill you, the angels will let me rest. And Spawn doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know that he's in the middle of a war between heaven and hell. So he's like, angels, what is he talking about? I'm losing consciousness there. I cannot take another impact. Well, guess what? Redeemer is going to redeem himself and put up another impact to Spawn. And from this blast right here, it looks like as if Spawn Spawn has a whole blast through his chest and he's in pain, lays down on the ground, he's like, I can't take any more of this bull jive. And Redeemer goes on in this rant, like, my head's filled with light, I can't think straight, I just have to kill you, then the fires will go out, I was once a man, 
was I a man? He questioned himself on that. Now I'm a fiery soldier of heaven, heaven's hunter, heaven's higher, and you. And he takes out this uh, hell spawn lightsaber sword upon from his wrist. You're just prey to me. And he's about to swipe away at spawn to, you know, looks like he's going to end him right then and there. He tells him, your time's up, Hellspawn, and that is the end of this issue. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know, and also link in the description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. This is definitely a, a fun read. I definitely like this better than part one because we get to see him duke it out, and that was fun for me. And don't forget to check out ratedcomics.com for some real cool comic books and some real cool rated comics exclusives to add to your comic book collection. So we begin this issue on the streets. This bum named Dipper is watching Spawn getting worked by the Redeemer at that point. So they go into a little backstory here. He was a private named Marty Sladek, but his nickname is Dipper. And he always has this thing that you gotta watch out for your buddies, and he has all these flashbacks of this horrific memories in Vietnam where he watched out for his buddies until this one time. But this is his redemption moment where now he sees Spawn getting worked on by the Redeemer, and he grabs a metal stick and he's like, you know what? You gotta watch out for your buddies. That's the rule. It ain't right. We just can't stand here and just let Spawn get worked on like that. He protected us. We gotta at least do something for him. And this is now. Now is the time. Before the Redeemer, the anti-Spawn can lend the final blow on our boy, he tells Spawn, you see L Spawn? It's so easy to die. And all Spawn could do is grin his teeth like, man, you got me worked and you got me messed up. And anti-Spawn's like, I promise to make it hurt. Before he can land the final blow, that metal crowbar, that metal stick goes behind, impacts behind anti-spawn the back of the head. But it does no damage at all. And all Dipper can say is, you gotta watch out for your buddies. Who? Says anti-spawn. You just ain't nothing but filth. I'll burn your eyes out. And these homeless bums, they all stick together like, I don't think so, pal. This is our turf. And we stick together. You got beef with me. You got beef with the spawn. You got beef with all of us. Anti-spawn is like, you don't know what the hell you're facing. I'll tear you all apart. And Spawn has a second burst of energy like, that's enough, bud. These people are under my protection. Now back away from the citizens and give me that ass because it's mine. We hungry. <laughs> Sorry, I had to find something to wake me up. So Spawn lends an impact blow, knocks him out like Rocky Balboa to Ivan Drago. Yeah, I know. I'm still on my Rocky mood right now. So he knocks him out. Boom! End of the fight. No, it's not the end of the fight. Redeemer, anti-spawn, lays out a blast of energy blast and spun docks it and spawns like, yo man, my costume is howling as he tags me with another energy blast. I can't let that impact and I gotta move. I gotta get a move on it fast. He's still weak and he can't afford to let him gain another advantage on him again. So anti-spawn lunges at him like, you think you could hurt me? Huh? Heaven soldier? I'll show you pain. This is what feels like. And he puts Spawn in another energy blast. And you see Spawn screaming, grinning. And he screams in pain. And it feels like live wires burning lights in his head. Jesus, don't let me pass out. That's all he can say. But guess what? Spawn has another burst of energy. Backhands him. Clobbers him. Let's another impact. Oh, mm. tell your mama to save me a plate. He don't know who his mama is, but hopefully she's a good cook. Anyway, so now Spawn is like, it looks like he could spend too much energy. Maybe his powers are similar to his. He doesn't know that. And he sees a window to land the final blow. But there's no time to think about it now. He just has to finish this. And anti-Spawn's like, I'll kill you. Yeah, says Spawn. Well, welcome to the real world, bastard. Have a nice day. And he does another necroplasm, full pure necroplasm blast to his head. Anti-spawn goes down for the count. He looks back up, but you can tell he's clearly hurt as light oozes out of his brain. I'll kill you. You see, I'll kill you. And Spawn's like, man, tell me about it. Spawn lands the final. I don't know how much power level that's going to drain from him, but that is a lot of necroplasm that Spawn is laying on the brother. You know, and guess what? That ends it. It's done. The creature gets sent back to heaven, even though he's smoking right now. And Spawn's like, well, I think I got him. And Dripper's like, yeah, I hit him. It scared the crap out of me, but I hit him. I mean, you got to watch out for your buddies, right? Did I do the right thing? And Spawn's like, yeah, you did, Dipper. You did the right thing, buddy. Now, as anti-Spawn lights up and these guys have to shield their eyes from all that brightness, he disappears just like that. Now, where did anti-Spawn go? 
high above the Earth orbits to the angel station, where the orbital angel station where he was created. So these orbital angels are like, this is the first test run. Nothing more. The hell spawn is stronger and more resourceful than we thought. So we must increase our soldiers' power levels and prepare him for more future encounters and prepare him more thoroughly. And so they hit it with more elemental fire. And all Jason Wynn could do, because if you watch the previous couple issues, anti-spawn is Jason Wynn recruited by these orbital angels involuntarily because they felt he was the right fit. He cannot take the pain. So he tells them, no more, please. This is burning too damn much. So back in the streets, though, Spawn's like, I don't know what the hell all that about, but I hope it's over. And this guy tells him, well, I heard you could be pretty dumb, but give me a break, all right? It ain't over. You think heaven goes to all the trouble of empowering an anti-spawn just to have a beat in one little scuffle? And Spawn's like, what? An anti-spawn? Who are you? I didn't see you earlier. And this guy's like, sure you did. You even saved my life. Although, to tell you the truth, it didn't need saving. We've been watching you, Simmons. I believe he met one of us before, a man named Callistiostro. And that's a reference to issue number nine. And this guy tells Spawn, you see, heaven and hell ain't the only players in this game. There are other powers and agencies owing allegiance to neither side, and there are methods whereby you can undo the bargain you made and retain your powers and get away from the chains of hell. And Spawn's like, okay, why are you telling me this? And this guy's like, well, believe me, you can't beat the devil. Who are you, says Spawn? Here's my card, and Spawn's like, yeah, but it's blank. Only for now, says the guy as he walks away. When the time comes, we'll be in touch. More questions for another day, but right now, there's still something that Spawn has to do as he looks at the blank card. And what he has to do is he has to go to the Nevada desert. There's a doorway to hell. It's a town, Simmonsville, and it's made out of something called Psychoplasma, a substance which changes shape to respond to thoughts and emotions. So they took Al Simmons' memories and used them to give form to this terrible place, and they took everything from Al, and now they perverted it. He's taking it all back and bringing it down the only way he knows how. Major Val's like, wait a minute, stop right there. Turn around and show yourself. Oh, damn it who are you and spawns like well 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 you don't remember me but i remember you major val you and jason Wynn were cut from the same cloth weren't you remember ecuador six good men died a whole village of innocent people was wiped out and you and jason covered the whole thing up and this guy is like major val is like how do you know about that that was a covert operation answer me that's an order and spawn gives him a hint well, maybe I got sick of taking orders from people like you, Val. Now, I'm giving you an order. Drop dead. And Spawn's like, well, I wish I could say that that made me feel better, but ain't no time for that. I gotta finish this job. And he watches all these buildings burn down to the ground. And he watched the house that he grew up in burn down to the ground. The bar he drank it burned down to the ground. The park in the school that his Uncle Martin store burned down to the ground. His life goes up in flames. Everything that was human is gone, except for one thing. The one memory of a perfect day remains as he stands in the blazing ruins. The memory of a sunlit spring day on the lake, the day he asked Wanda Blake to marry him. The best day of his life. So he uses his mind to collapse the entire scene, shaping the psychoplasm into a more manageable form. He takes the last memory, the last good memory, and reduces it to a single spark. That was the best day, the best thing he ever did, and it was worth keeping, but he can't break it or lose it, so he kept that memory into a spark. He supposes he should put it somewhere safe. So he goes to Queens, New York. Wanda Blake is looking at all the rain, and Terry Fitzgerald's like, Wanda, you know, come to bed, come on, girl. Time to get jiggy with it, na, 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 na. Can't do that with all the rain because Wanda's looking out there talking about, I don't know, I'm just thinking we're so lucky to have everything we have, right? And I just feel so sorry for anyone that's out there that has to be out there in all that rain right now. And Spawn's out there in that way. That memory, that spark of the wedding proposal, well, he stayed it for her. He sheds it to her. It goes in her head and Terry's like, what happened? And she sheds a tear or many tears, as much tears as the raindrops. And she's like, something just came in my head. I seem to remember something and then it was gone. It was, you know, it was beautiful. It was very touching to her. And Spawn tells her that he loves her. And Terry tells Wanda off screen, off panel, close the drapes, honey, time to come to bed. The window goes dark, the world goes dark, but that's okay, cause our boy Spawn's used to it. Darkness is his new home now. And that's where we end this review of Spawn, issue number 18. Yo, man, this is classic, this is gangster, I love it right here. And I can't wait to do more old school Spawn comic book reviews on this channel. Link in description if you wish to add this comic book and or some of our 
are other rated comics exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. So we begin this issue with a news article talking about Houdini's astounding capacity and ability to escape. Tan handcuffs and concerned police are all intentive about it. So he makes his escape. But on this other side of the panel, in a bunker underneath Nagasaki, Japan, August 1945, these men of influence from religion, business, and the military focus their energies to gain aid from the army of a different emperor, one of darkness. These demons, and these demons use that smoke from that flame as a portal to see through. Then this huge explosion atomic weapon happens. That ignition created a portal allowing demons through to the earth realm. Now, somewhere in the Soviet Union several years ago, Al Simmons is looking to assassinate Yosef Volokov and if I butchered his name that's a Russian name I don't speak Russian the only Russian I speak is white Russian <laughs> anyway so as Al Sim is about to pull the trigger and assassinate he gets bombarded with all these bullets and he has to go on the run move 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 that he does he ducks and dodges goes through the door he's inside the door then he gets met point blank this gun is about to pull the trigger in the Bowery New York City 5 10 in the morning Spawn wakes up and he's like, oh, ooh, that was a nightmare. And he looks at the shopping cart like, yo, man, that wasn't there when I went to sleep. And before he can finish the word sleep, an explosion happens. And he's pissed in flames. And he tells the bomber, your meats. And then magically, this guy in a tuxedo appears. And the bomber's running away like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And as Spawn's about to go to work on this, bro. Houdini is like, yo, we need to talk hell spawn. And spawn's like, I can't let him get away. He blew me up. Don't worry about it. I snagged his wallet and we can find him later. For now, we have more pressing matters to discuss. Now, in this panel right here, we get an idea of who the bomber is. I mean, he's 20 years old, has his own apartment downtown, but he still brings his dirty socks home to mama. I guess they're trying to indicate how cray cray this guy is. Now, this guy has no respect, nothing. And all these guys at this deli or at the smoke shop say to one another, when I was his age, I stayed around and supported my mother and the family. At least that kid has a good job in electronics. Yosef gets up and puts his hat on and says, speaking of jobs, I better get going to the airport. An old friend called to say that he's coming in and he has luggage that needs special care. So at the airport, Andre Zlenko, he left his Ukrainian homeland and he brings his luggage. And you could tell there's some dangerous stuff in that luggage with his Ukrainian henchman. And there goes our boy Yosef helping out. And he knows something's about to go down. Now they plan on using his nuclear luggage luggage for something. But now that we get a sticker that it was inspected by United States Customs, how do they let this pass by? Maybe atomic weapons were not really a thing or maybe the US Customs was in on it. But no matter what, something's about to go down. So at Columbia University, it's a late on Saturday evening, the second day of the East-West Atomic Warfare Science and Applications Conference. Several speakers from the Eastern Bloc decide to sample the real America. And what they decide to do is they go to the Gentleman's Club, up in the club, to get some club and some hub so to speak so they start bragging about their science and their intellect bravado and one guy's like it's such a saying that our science will never be put to practical use and the other guy's like yes ours is a dying profession what good is it to know how to destroy the earth if we never get a chance to use it and now all these guys these kgb spies in suits go up behind them and they keep talking like as if they're not there so another atomic scientist says any spy worth his metal would love our fusion data and this last guy's like did any of you meet kadav's envoy now there's a man who can make all of us very wealthy. So one of the convoy, one of the KGB convoys goes to the payphone and tells him this is Misha, get me station chief, Ivanov. Yosef notice you're right. All that loud and crazy talk we're doing got one of our KGB shadows out of the way and now the others are distracted. Let's head for the exit. Let's go. They all just go hop out of there and this, this guy gets scolded like you try to nab you idiot. You take your eyes off of them for one second and you mess it all up. So Yosef tells him I'll see you guys back at the conference tomorrow. But yeah, but there's more bars to visit. Where are you going to go? Oh, don't worry about that. Elsewhere, this place is known as the Overlap. It is a reality that intersects all planes of existence. It is the birthplace of what is called magic. There are no spiritual or physical laws here. Reality is elastic here. Now the realm is inhabited by powerful beings from a million million worlds away. And each denizen, each world has his, her, or its own priorities and assignments. The overlap is primarily a place of discovery and experimentation, a laboratory without bounds. Now one such group is in the meeting now to discuss their current foray in the human 
the spiritual space and the physics of hell. And this guy, this in the overlaps, tells the people in the meeting that he's been keeping an eye on the Earthians and their atomic fetishes. And they haven't all killed each other yet, so I've managed to push things in a direction that'll give us some answers soon. Our last survey, where a hell creature was blown up, was a bust. But that's okay though. We weren't prepared for that event the way we are now. This time, I plugged a thought program into a scientist there. He'll detonate an atom bomb at the preset time. A demon, the latest hell spawn, will be near ground zero. I placed the agent there to make sure that the creature's in place, and we know the strength of the blast. So we've taken viewing precautions because of that strength of blast. And the best part is, Houdini is the agent on the scene, so we're ready to go. And his other demon's like, I trust that that pest will verify the nature of the hell creature's powers and temperament first before the explosion goes off, and that will be useful information. Houdini is using one of our portal devices. I told him it's more efficient at transport than meditation or whatever his usual methods are. So we got to make sure we get this right. He will not have time to adjust to his normal mode of transfer and we will perish so he cannot mess this up. So right now in little Ukraine at midnight, Yosef comes across the bomber and he asks the bomber about Andre Selenko. So the bomber just tells him he's in room 301 but the old man is probably passed out by now. And we see the bomber getting to work on his latest bomb, making a phone call to his friend, talking about, yo man, I blew up the alleyway and the guy chased me when he was all shooting flames. And his friend is like, yo bro, Bro, I bet you wet your pants like not even bro not even but you know what tonight I'm gonna blow up that alleyway and I'm gonna bring the heat on this one so now Houdini and Spawn this is the more interesting part of the comic right here Spawn can't believe he's actually talking to Houdini because he's dead and Houdini's like aren't you dead well it's kind of hard to believe at this point so I don't know if I'm really talking to Houdini and so Houdini's like well which part is hard to believe that I'm a dimension traveling hyper image 10,000 times more powerful than my stage act led on to be or that you're in vulnerable ultra stone horrible puppet of hell and spawns like both I guess so now Houdini knows good I've tweaked his interest or at least his curiosity at that point so Houdini tells him however I didn't come here to discuss our you know conditions I'm here to speak with you about you Hellspawn about you and your powers and Spawn's like well what do you know about my powers you're just an escape artist oh no oh contraire my friend I'm way more than an escape artist are you aware how many years I spent non-magical grueling years learning to be just an escape artist as it turns out those levels of concentration led to my accidental extra dimensional discoveries like for instance I know magic magic real magic and he disappears and he reappears right in another side of spawn so what did you see an illusion a smoke pellet teleportation does it matter that was magic that I moved from point A to point B in a non-mundane matter it was the result not the method that matter even though he has assistance from those demons in the overlap but he's really working spawn right now and he tells spawn magic is about perception and the will's ability to alter that perception using energies magic is like telling a lie so convincing that even the universe believes you and you my friend are a creature of magic albeit of finite power however you need to exhaust your powers. That symbiotic costume can do much more work for you without you using your powers. For example, good God, look behind you, Spawn. And his chain links go behind and react. And Houdini tells him the point. You see, with only a thought, your suit attacks for you. It's expense, it's energy, not years. Then Houdini pulls out a bomb. Now in the case of a bomb, your suit reacts to the threat and acted to keep you from harm without your conscious direction. Your energy is not used at all. And there's more, says Houdini. Your most important power as a creature of sorcery is manifestation. With a clear head and a strong will, you can cause your costume to make just about anything provided you understand its essence. For example, think of something small like a marble. You know what it feels like and looks like and all? Activate your costume, reach out, the molecules are float free, grab them, think of the marble and go on. And Spawn's like, okay, a marble? And he makes a marble statue. And Houdini's like, well, pretty close, we'll try again. But I was thinking of something small like a marble, but you made a marble statue. Then these gangs, these thugs come here like, looky here, fellas. We got ourselves a regular circus on the roof. Brains, Divvy, you and me, we take the rich guy in the tux. Link take the geek <laughs> yeah you said it smokey and spawns like yeah come on get me link okay you gonna link this chain up right here link meet my chains and spawn goes to work on link 
And Brains, Demi, and Smokey Houdini's like, well, let your name speak your fate. And Brains, we see Brains, and Smoke, we see Smoke. And Spawn's like, what the hell came over you? You mutilated those kids. Nothing of the sort, says Houdini. It was a visible illusion based on their ludicrous nicknames. They'll snap out of it soon. Whereas you, my friend, you were positively more brutal because of your powers. And Spawn's like, yeah, my powers. How is it that everyone else I meet knows so much about me and I don't know squat? And Houdini tells him, well, you know more about yourself if you try something new every now and again. Your abilities are vast, yet you're still thinking like a mortal. So Spawn's like, and you, what are you then, Hotshot? And Houdini at this point thinks, I've got him. Unlike you, I'm just human. When and where I come from, I play the escape artist. Part of my time, though, is spent in the heart of magic, the overlap, where I'm a prankster and annoyance for you. I'm the ticket to knowledge. And speaking of tickets, I'm taking you to a show beyond your wildest dreams. But here's your tickets. Be less conspicuous. Put these on and tone that costume down, all right? And at that moment, three stories below, the bomber is going to work again. So another explosion happens below. And Spawn realizes before he gets in the car with his old chaperone and looking like a limo driver at that point, he sees that kid. He's like, oh no, I'm gonna nail that punk to the wall with his own bones. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And Houdini says, just drive, bro. But we'll see what happens with this bomber at this point. Now, meanwhile, in Queens, New York, the home of Spawn's widow, Wanda Blake, her husband, Terry Fitzgerald, and her daughter, Cyan. It's a blissful Sunday morning. It's just five minutes past five, and Terry gets a phone call, and he gets a call from his, uh, from someone high up. So this person over the phone tells Terry that these people smuggle an atomic device and customs at JFK aren't all that they could be, and they let this one slip by. So we need you out in the field, and Terry's like, yo, man, I'm not a field person. My job is to read Russian, not speak Russian. It doesn't matter. We need you on this one. So Wanda wakes up. She's asking what's going on. And Terry's like, it's a new schedule thing, honey. So I got to do so. I got to be in the field. And then Wanda's like, did he say atomic device? And that is the end of this review of Spawn issue number 19. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below. Let me know. As of right now, this issue has piqued my interest. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this story arc ends. With all that being said, link in description if you wish to add this comic book and or some of our rated comments exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. In this issue, exactly where we left off in the last issue, Spawn and Houdini will Spawn looking like a chauffeur on the way to the magic show. And Spawn is wondering how the heck is Houdini making this car defy gravity? And Houdini's like, defy gravity? Nonsense. I've simply convinced gravity that the car is lighter than the air. Remember in the last issue when Houdini told Spawn, magic is simply telling the universe the biggest lie, so convincing that the universe believes in it? Well, that's pretty much it sums it up. And Spawn is like, this doesn't seem natural to me. Well, Houdini's like, that's why I'm teaching you. But meanwhile, Spawn sees that punk, that bomber from the last issue, and he wants in on that butt. So late night, the silence of Manhattan's little Ukraine is cut by the roar of the bomber speeding car. Unknown to him, a demon and his newfound mentor are in silent pursuit. So he gets home and this bomber just gets out the car like, yo man, that was the best explosion I did. I gotta see if I made the cut on the news. And Spawn looks at him going into his apartment like he's working for someone, the mob or somebody. And Houdini's like, who cares? We can get him later. I got two invites to the Magician's Club for some after hours fun. One of the boys has a trunk of mine I like to look into, so are you coming? And Spawn's like, nah, bruh, I'm sticking to this kid like glue. Something will churn up. And Houdini's like, okay, bro, suit yourself, no problem. So time passes slowly, but when he was alive and a soldier, Al Simmons was used to waiting. And while he was waiting on more info about the bomber, he thought about this memory being in Monterey, California language school along with Terry. And the only way he can remember how he got through was because he met his best friend Terry because, you know, he copied papers off of him to read. Actually, Terry is his best friend. So down below, Spawn hears Terry's voice talking to the Russians. And he asked the Russians to come inside so we can talk because he has some questions to answer to ask them. And the Russians like, of course, it's warmer inside. Come on in. And your accent needs practicing. You little spy, let us teach you. And they go to work on Terry. And Spawn has to come in and save his best friend's life. Leave him alone, Spawn says. That's my friend. Chains go off. The guns go blazing. Spawn takes all the bullets on behalf of Terry, saving his life. And Spawn just continues going to work. And he's so enraged and so pissed if it will hurt you more I'd kill you so now that the damage has been done he takes Terry out the building 
So when Spawn reads Terry's files, Spawn notices what? Yosef Volokov? He's here? I almost bagged him years ago and I was back in the previous issue when it was clearly remembered, established that, hey, Spawn was supposed to annihilate him. He was supposed to assassinate him. It says here that he's here for some weapons conference and went AWOL, but oh my gosh, dude. Okay. And now I see this Volokov in front of the punk's building? In front of this bomber's building? That's where Spawn brings Terry back into? Alright, cool. I'm not going to go easy on the guy. So he tells Terry, go easy. Lean on the car. It's all good. And Spawn realizes so Volokov and his bomber and whatever this thing is going on he has some unfinished business to execute so terry wakes up like oh yo man what happened and spawn's like well you know what brother you might be more careful with people around here you know and spawn does not let terry know who he really is he can't let him know that he's al simmons and terry tells him thanks you know thanks for pulling my pulling my ass out the skillet or something like that you know spawn lets his motivations be known to us he doesn't want wanda to become a widow again so terry calls for backup because whatever this intel is it's inaccurate and he wants some muscle to get things straight so in the apartment volokov tells his friend that he's due to give a lecture in a couple hours and a key electrical element was damaged on his journey in his briefcase and this guy tells him don't worry my neighbor's son works for electronics firm he's really good and really skilled he can get that fixed for you and spawn outside the window hearing in is like atomic weapons i knew there was more here than what meets i i don't know who this kid's working for but this must be big terry called in some goons for that and he sure did so meanwhile terry and his goons and his muscle come in and they start investigating and terry is like you know what forget them after all this is going on we have to get to columbia asap so houdini pulls up and tells spawn you missed a good show man but nothing like the one we're going to hop on in and spawns like nah we have to get to columbia university something dangerous is going on and houdini's like you peeked at these didn't you you peeked at these tickets these tickets i got from that kid's wallet i knew it the kid works for the commies so they go to the columbia university day three of the conference terry and his goons try to go in but this guy is like nah man you, you're here for the demonstration of the atomic detonator i'm charging you six bucks a head and terry's like wait a minute what does he mean demonstration of an atomic detonator and fuck your six bucks i'm going in man so volokov meets the detonator his name is porsche and he asked Porsche if he could fix the problem. And Porsche's like, man, I can fix anything, bro. I'm good to go. So Volokov was like, okay, well, hurry, because I got a speech coming up shortly, and I need your help. So back at Columbia University, halfway across town, and less than an hour later, it's a surprisingly large turnoff for the dry topic at hand, you know, which is atomic bomb detonation, and, and people won't be disappointed. So the audience grows quiet as Yosef Volokov, a pioneer of the former Soviet Union's atomic program, walks to the podium. This is his proudest moment but there is another reason for Yosef to be here his objective is not recognition his objective is the well-being of his country the Ukraine is his sole concern and the moment is at hand members of the audience smile in recognition and there's no mistaking the chromium steel object for anything but what it is an atomic bomb a briefcase he also withdraws a shielded container it is enough plutonium for a bomb which could level a good sized city the size of New York so Yosef speaks ladies and gentlemen rather than my lecture I will now present my demands my Ukraine has languished in poverty while her cousin Russia has gained all the attention of the world you and your government shall loan my Ukraine 1.5 billion dollars or I shall destroy New York City Terry and his goons get the guns out blazes out and they're ready to go to work on this guy guns with commie says spawn oh and a sorcerer with the bigger gun says houdini and he's trigger happy they're all ready to pull the trigger so meanwhile the overlappers have come before prime by far the oldest of the creatures dwelling here and linked directly into the living realm himself all data gathered from a billion universes is fed directly through this guy so that the overlap may be nourished and thrive and it has been going like that forever so the other overlappers tell prime we will soon learn if it is possible to destroy a hell creature with the atomic bomb our experiment will provide us with much needed data on the physical extremes of the creature and of this earthian as well and as far as houdini goes well, you know, we've cut off the particle splitting device, and with that, we've also condemned Houdini to his end. 
and prime is like very good i am certain you will have fresh knowledge to feed us however this houdini is your own affair all right so back on earth yosef tells everyone to remain calm your guns will not stop us i'm gonna pull the trigger if i don't get my money all right so always the performer houdini starts to show with a shot fired into there which gets everyone riled up and bricked up <laughs> That was that was stupid. Anyways, that was weird. So, anyways, these nerves step and all these shots get fired, and Spawn has to jump in front of Terry again and save his life because he takes all the bullets for him. The exits are few and far between, and chaos ensues. And Yosef is like, "You fools, you idiots! I'm gonna start the timer now." He starts the timer and the clock goes down. Houdini realizes down at 15 seconds, everyone has to run for their lives, and Houdini's like, "Okay, I've done my part. That's my cue to check up out of here." So when he realizes those schmucks shut him out and it's time that he paid them a piece of his mind he concentrates it's just another trap he mentalizes everything he got to set up his pathway he visualizes it and all these overlap bros are like this is our moment to think we feared houdini ha! oh no houdini focus and he transmits the blast and he takes all the atoms like candy glass containing the bomb he sends all that bomb explosion into this fragments he contains it and puts it in his trunk. Spawn carries on unaware of the package and went behind him and venting his rage on Terry's attackers. So Houdini compresses that beam of power, that beam of explosion into his trunk and he sends that tight particle stream where it will do the most good. We will find out that later. So Spawn at Columbia University realizes, damn, Houdini is fried and I had so much to learn from the guy. I mean, that's if he was really Houdini, you know, and, and that leaves Spawn in confusion. So news coverage breaks out, several arrests have been made, all these Russians go to jail, and the bomber too. But witnesses claim that there was an explosion, and even though they don't know what happened to the explosion, because to them it appeared like in a flash of a light, rumor has it that Spawn, but they call that guy the Chris Man, was there. And there's no proof of that, but that's just alleged news, but we know the real. So elsewhere on the Columbia campus, Spawn goes up there and he wants to go find Houdini's invisible car. So at Spawn's test, he just concentrates, uses the costume to rearrange the photons to make the car appear. And when the car reappears, Spawn's like, good, good, yeah, I passed the test. Houdini says, I learned a trick or two, but he realizes he needs the keys. So he'll just manifest them himself, but by creating the keys, Spawn passed Houdini's test. The car's purpose is fulfilled. It defaults back to the overlap. So Spawn now realizes how he can use magic and manipulate photons and atoms. Now back in the Bowery, life has returned to normal in the hours after the lecture. The police left with no evidence of crime have dropped all charges against Portia. And Portia gets home and he's hungry. He should have stopped at his mom's place and got some food, but that's okay. So this explosion happens, but it was just like a phantom explosion. It was loud, the blast was harmless, confetti falls carrying paper rain with a note in it. Don't ever mess with me or my alley again, or the next one takes you out and the whole building with it. So now we're back at the overlap, and that's where the atomic decimation took place. So Houdini transported the explosion from the Columbia University into the overlap inside his trunk. The experiment has blown up in their faces. In the distance, unexpected guests became to rain in in their equilibrium, and it's these Russian mobs. And they're wondering, like, what the hell are we? Are we in hell? How long are we here to stay? Is this the afterlife? Not at all, earthy and scum. Now that your energy has been dampened, you have much to answer for and even more to clean. It will be interesting to see how your kind will fare against a radiation burns. Little humans, we have forever to learn. Get the cleaning. And that's all they can do is get the cleaning, all right? So back in 1916 on the stage in Los Angeles, Houdini performs his act. No normal human being could have survived this long five minutes without air. And Houdini emerges and mystifies them when he shows. Like, yeah, I survived, no problem. But his assistants are like, okay, where's his cape? And Houdini just tells him, thank you, you guys are too kind. So Houdini thinks in his head, perhaps I can use that diverted explosion gimmick into my next show. And luckily for him, he'll say that encore for another day. And that's how we end this issue, this review of Spawn, issue number 20. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know. And also link in description if you wish to add this comic book and or any of our other comic books or rated comics exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. In the Bowery alleyways of New York, in a city of a million voices, we focus our attention upon 
uh, two in particular. It's a spawn getting stitched up by this guy because of what happened in the Batman Spawn series where Batman threw a batarang at Spawn and he got laced up in some shoelaces. And Spawn calls him a bozo in black, but at MK11, he calls him a billion dollar crusader and he's a friend. You remind me of another Dark Knight. The billion dollar crusader, he's a friend. So after Spawn gets stitched up, he asks this guy, so how do I look? And the guy is like, I love it. Big bad Bobby saves the day once again, <laughs> shoelacing Spawn's face. You know, if I wasn't such a loser, I think I was a winner. But to be completely honest, I really don't see why we gotta worry about your vanity, Spawn. I mean, it's not like the hamburger head of yours was a worker art to begin with. And Spawn's like, alright man, thanks for the words of encouragement. And then Big Bad Bobby's like, and look, I didn't even have to use my own shoelace. I stole this from a puppy from one of them dorks over on 52nd. It's all good. So Spawn goes into this contemplating mode like, you know, my life, nothing's good is happening. Every time I make a move, there's some creeps out there trying to make a name for themselves. I mean, I used to know what the difference of good and bad was, but everything's all screwed up now. I mean, heaven, hell, demons, magic. You name it, they're all after me on some level. And it's making me feel drained, I'm mentally tired of it all. This isn't what I wanted, none of it. I just wanted to be with my wife, just my wife wanted. Nothing else does make any sense, Bobby. And Bobby's like, okay, look, let me tell you something here. I used to be a merry man too, to a saint of a woman. But, you know, she's been putting up with me for 20 years. I met her at a trench function. But she got brain cancer. And obviously, I don't recommend it to anyone. So it ate away at me. But to see that brain cancer ate away at that woman like acid. So the doctors couldn't do nothing. You see, I haven't handled it well, says Bobby to Al Simmons. I've handled it with, like, I couldn't even pick up the pieces I carry on. So I wallow in self-pity until I lost everything. And I don't want your pity. That's not the point. I just don't want you to turn out like me and be like me or the other guys, you know? So what I'm trying to say is, Spawn, is you're okay. You need to find your answers, then do it. Just don't lose sight of what you already have which is us. Since you showed up, things have been strange around here. Maybe it's all your fault. Maybe it's not all your fault. But you know what? We like having you around. It makes us feel cocky. It gives us a whole new sense of purpose. So for you, you need to pick up the pieces. And that way, if you don't pick up your pieces and move on, then you're not better of any of us. So for your safety, we need you to be more than that. We need you to be more than us. And that gives Spawn a whole new sense of purpose and mojo like, thanks, Bob. Thanks a lot. It's time I start taking control this life. So Spawn then disappears into the black ocean of shadows, leaving behind one of his many admirers. But one person that is not admiring Spawn has a serious case of messing it all up is Jason Wynn. Because one, he came back after being the redeemer of the past couple issues, and now that was his like gap in life, his version of the blip, if you want to call it that. Marvel, do not get me on copyright infringement. I'm just trying to make a point here, using you as an example. But Wynn is now, he's his goons, his agents are telling him, ever since your disappearance, we're now finishing up this brief. And after extensive cross-checking, we have to conclude that Agent Fitzgerald should no longer be considered a suspect behind the recent security breaches. Keep in mind, issues before, Jason Wynn was under the impression, or he wanted Fitzgerald to be the suspect, but now the local police are involved, they're monitoring him, and then there's 10 FBI agents on the case. So his goons are telling him we should possibly call them off and maybe kind of find another suspect. But Jason Wynn is trapped. And trapped is not a position he's found himself in all too often. So if he calls off his goons at this point, he's admitting defeat and weakness at this point. So Jason Wynn tells him, hey, I got to flex over here. So let's continue the surveillance as usual. Fitzgerald remains our prime target. All right. So follow him. Wait on further instructions. All right. And his goons are like, but sir, are you sure? By the way, Agent Ronick, if you ever question my orders again, says Jason Wynn, I will have you killed. So in this panel right here, Terry Fitzgerald is also questioned from those colleagues. You know, they're harassing him. His FBI agents that were his colleagues, well, Jason Wynn gave the order, so now they're harassing him. Like, watch your six, stuff is gonna get crazy, there's nothing you can do, you look innocent now, but you know what, guys like you make our job twice as hard. We got enough problems with civilians, yeah, and we don't like problems around. They're just heckling the heck out of 
Terry Fitzgerald. So Terry can only stand there in silence as the threats and innuendo slice ever go deeper in, in him. Like, you know, it goes in his mind, it goes in his skin, and it's just crawling. He's like, yo, man, what the fuck did I do, you know? And even though he didn't do anything, Jason Wynn has to pin something on him. So while they're still harassing him, his phone rings, and he's been harassed by every major security force in the nation. So Jason Wynn's displeasure is felt in the agency, all while Terry Fitzgerald just has to take it, take it like a G, you know, just take that bitch in like no other. But while his phone is ringing, his colleagues, even though now they're harassing him, was telling him to answer the phone call. It's Wanda. She's just reminding him that, hey, don't forget about our dinner date tonight. Oh, and I gotta tell you about what happened in Cyan at the park. How'd your meeting go? And Terry's like, you know, I just finished the meeting. It's nothing to pour. It's nothing special. And they're just telling like, watch your back, Terry, because ain't no one's watching out for you. We'll be in touch. Ah. And, and Terry's just like, you could tell like in that panel right there, like he's ready to throw some blows and some haymakers and molly wop somebody. Speaking of molly whopping, Sam is molly whopping this guy because she's trying to find the whereabouts of Spawn. But they don't know that they're looking for Spawn. They're looking for a red cape because in Spawn issue number five, and in spot issue number 14, which we did cover those issues, that's all they have to go on is a cape crusader, a red cape crusader of that. And it's only a matter of time before they find him. So they ask this guy, what can you tell me about it? And this guy's like, suck me fat boy. I ain't giving you nothing. I know my rights. And Sam's like, okay, yeah, I, I know you know you're right. Like the right to do business with those high school kids you keep shoving your drugs into? Yeah, you know, it won't be a good professional image if you suddenly have to peddle your stuff and yourself from a wheelchair. It won't make you look cool in front of the kids, now would it? So Sam is like, I'm gonna give you two options. Option number one, you got 48 hours to tell me where this guy is at, where this red cape crusader scumbag is at. If you do, I'll only confiscate your drugs and make sure you don't set up shop again. But if you don't, I'll make sure you get put away for so long you wish you brought stock. Not brought, I mean bought stock in the Vaseline company. Do I make myself clear, says Sam. And he steps on his hand, and for the next 48 hours, Jimmy Linden, even though he displays remarkable initiative and pain tolerance, he's got a decision to make. So somewhere else in the city, Al Simmons huddles quietly in a discarded waste of the real world, camouflaged by the makeshift bedding of the homeless. He doesn't want to be bothered. But during those loneliest hours, he wonders how he has become so distracted from the simple goal of this new life. To set things straight with his widow, Wanda Blake, he's not surprised and again this complication does crop up. So this guy goes up to him and says, hey man, some Nazi skinhead is out looking for you, says he was sent by the mafia, so he's gonna knock a few heads until you show. And he also calls you a punani at that point too. So Spawn's pissed, he goes on many levels of this enragement because one, they're messing with him, and two, these homeless people tell him that you're family now, so Spawn, deep down, he's a family man. You know, just, we're gonna go with that. And it's also time to emphasize the point, loudly and clearly, that you don't mess with my people, and you don't mess with Spawn. So Spawn's overlooking this guy getting heckled by this skinhead Nazi, you know? Anyone who lives on the streets must be a freaking psycho, and Spawn's like, all right, bro, I gotta step in. So Spawn goes up behind him and tells him, you called? And his fingers are so sharp that they go through his flesh, and maybe a little bit of bone, too, and he locks it in tight, and all this guy can do is just scream in pain. Ah, like that? I like a minute of your time. And this guy is like, Ugh, my arm! I'm gonna ask you only once, says Spawn. Who sent you and where do I find him? Listen, freak, you don't know who you're messing with. When the mob gets mad, people get hurt, including you. And Spawn's like, ha ha, you took the words right out of my mouth. Throws him against the walls, crash and trash and all that looking sass. And this guy tells her, don't screw with these guys. They'll hurt you. They'll hurt your family and friends, even your freaking pets. So do yourself a freaking favor and get out of here. It'll save everyone a lot of trouble and a lot of blood. I'm like, I know I kind of making this guy sound like a poo-poo, but you know what? This guy is a poo-poo for messing with Spawn. You just don't do 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 that. Bruh. Okay, that was probably cheesy, but hey, I'm going to go with it. So Spawn says nothing. He just crouches over the guy and stares. And 20 seconds has passed, and this guy is like, are you freaking crazy? They'll kill you. They'll kill you. You hear me? He's just kind of emphasizing the point. And Spawn's like, you know what? Don't call me a dead man. Because guess what? I'm already freaking dead. Look at that. And Spawn shows him his own hamburger face, shoelaced, 
ugliness, but you know what? And this guy gives him a little terror. So Spawn tells him, you know what? Tell your boss he can't possibly do any worse. And who is your boss, by the way? Mr. Gravano. Vito Gravano. Now, in the earlier issues, I believe in Spawn issue number six, it was Tony Twist. But because of a lawsuit, Todd McFarlane had to change the name. So we're going to go with Vito Gravano for Tony Twist, even though we probably can't legally use that name. But you can't sue me. You ain't got nothing to take from me anyway. Actually, yeah, we all got something to lose. Don't do that. Just joking. But anyway, so back to the story here. So Spawn tells him that fat ass, how many whooping of his boys do I need to spank? You tell Mr. Gravano this, that if he thinks he could do any worse to me, then I'll be waiting and tell him not to take too long. I'm not very patient. Otherwise, I'll be paying him a visit very soon. Yeah, I am that crazy, man. All right. So Spawn punches him back, get back, you don't know me like that. So now this guy goes back to Mr. Gravano and tells him a report of what transpired. And Mr. Gravano's like, ah, looks like this town's got another hero trying to make himself a name for himself, but not at my expense. You know what? You're fired. Get out of my office. Closes the door, slams the door. Now this guy, this other henchman, tells Mr. Gravano that we've been looking into links between the murders of your associates and some other disruptive situations. One, the clown, the smashing of the higher gun overkill, and the evasion of your office by the costume vigilante. So this guy tells him, call in the admonisher to deal with the clown. And this is dealing with the events of the violator issue number one, which we did cover the entire series of the violator issue number one, two, and three, which in my opinion, that was an awesome story right there but going back to overkill there's some new leads that have been transpiring with it that graviano has been informed about so the people at the fbi and the cia both confirmed that the theft of those weapons at his warehouse were sufficient enough in firepower to pierce overkill's armor i mean it took some arm twisting but they got they believe they found someone with sticky fingers and that someone is well they're trying to ping it too is terry fitzgerald an operative for some ultra covert agency so now graviano is pissed and he's like you know if i find out in any way that this guy terry fitzgerald is connected to this mysterious guy you know what his boss is mine screw it he's already connected i would i will not be trifled with so graviano's just pissed you know some government geek wants to play good guy fine as long as he doesn't cross my boundaries but because he's crossed my boundaries get me the status on overkill's files current condition they said they'll be done with him by now i need it get the job done we need some deaths to happen to set the thing straight so that is where graviano is at and because he wants to files of overkill well spawn is just waiting in the alley as all this thing is playing out like a public service announcement or an amber alert but you know what? it's one that spawn knows is coming as he's waiting in the alleyways whatever this uh overkill is gonna come up and you know what hopefully there's somebody with enough guts to stand up to him and fight back and if there's only one person that can do that it is our boy spawn and that is the end of this issue of spawn issue number 21 we begin this issue with Joe Sacken. He's an accountant to Vito Gravano. This accountant is a loyal servant to the mob. He works up the numbers to make sure that when the mob gets audited, that they'll have a clean legal operation that they will remain untouched. But you know what? He's working diligently away, 15 hours a day. Spawn comes in and he wants some information. Hello, Joe, let's talk. And this scares the crap out of Joe. Your boss, I want to know exactly where he is. You see, the fat man's been asking for me. I thought, I answer his call and this account's like ugh, ugh, ugh. you know he can he can't even muster any words and spawn gets pissed like if you don't clear up that starting boy I'm gonna have to kill you you understand uh he's g -g 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 gone I mean he's not here I mean he wanted to check up on one of his other um business matters and spawns like well I believe you that's convincing just tell me where Vito is and I'll let you go home otherwise we got a problem you know freeze the door opens and spawn has to turn his head and divert his attention Make a move and you're dead, says the mobsters. Step away from Mr. Sackick. Now, nice and slow, and I mean very slow, like Marvin Gaye foreplay, kind of love making slow. Hey, anyways, so they kind of wondering, like, how does Spawn get in here anyway? So without warning, his chain lunges forward like rattlesnakes. The security guards didn't know what to expect, but it wasn't that. So they start shoot. They blast away. Shoot first, ask questions later. They react the way they know best. So, but little did Spawn know 
And he started to grow accustomed to this, you know, costume that actively, you know, defends his life. You know, it's like his life and the symbiote's life are joined as one. He knows what's being at stake here, so he's all good with this. So they keep shooting away and they realize their bullets are have a serious case of not doing nothing to Spawn. So what Spawn does to them is a lot more severe than those bullets. He throws a desk at them, splats on the wall. And yeah, that's that. So Spawn's like, well, 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 now, where were we? This guy don't shiv under pressure, especially at tax time. But when it comes to dealing with Spawn, he doesn't know what the heck to do. So he grabs a file in an attempt, a very feeble attempt at that, to kind of hide the evidence. So Spawn's like, what have you got there, Joe? Um, nothing. Well, guess what? Joe does have something. So Spawn grabs a file. He's like, what is this? This file's on Terry? All right, I'm gonna be borrowing this for a while. So thanks, Joe. And Spawn melts away into the darkness, okay? So the security personnel can find no trace of his visit. But as for Joe, three days from now, his body will be found under the George Washington Bridge with his hands and feet viciously severed, decapitated, even his genitals will be missing. So much for being a loyal employee for Vito Gravano, right? So in the office, Sam Burke and Twitch Williams receive a lead from Jimmy London on the streets, their snitch about the whereabouts of Spawn's hangout. So as Sam gets some flack from his fellow officer Fred about internal affairs, about, you know, what are you guys really doing? Are you guys really going to go out to chase some ghost? I mean, he's a ghost for a reason and harass some homeless people because you think this case is so big? This leads Sam to spit in his coffee because you know what? They got to do what they got to do. When they got to stick up their ass about something, they going to fulfill that duty, all right? So in this panel right here, recent events have cast doubts on Jason Wynn's credibility. Wynn is unable to explain his disappearance for two days. And, you know, that's because he was an agent of heaven and was made into a warrior, the redeemer in Spawn issues 16 through 18, which we did cover that in this channel. But somehow, someone has leaked the odd circumstances to the media about his disappearances. So enemies have been circling, looking for a weakness to exploit in Jason Wynn. The White House is very unhappy with this. And on top of that, a thorough investigation has proven that Fitzgerald is clean. That's what Wynn wanted to do. He wanted to frame Terry Fitzgerald or something. So Jason Wynn cannot afford even the appearance of professional inadequacy. Therefore, Fitzgerald inquiry will continue. His guilt is predetermined. Wynn will not fail. Reputation and power are all that's at stake for him. Terry Fitzgerald concentrates on his monitor, trying to forget the harassing phone calls and face-to-face -face threats that he's been dealing with lately. Practically every law enforcement or intelligent agency in the state has made their displeasure known to him. He's grateful that Wanda is unaware of this witch hunt and that his family's unaware of it, his family's untouched. At least he knows that. But you know what? It could have been the debacle at the Columbia University, which we covered in Spawn issue 19 and 20, but that's for another time, another deal. Terry's secretary screams out in horror as she sees his box. It's open, and Terry's like, Julia, what is it? Turns out it's a dead rat with a note and a knife in it that says, Dear Fitz, you're a dead rat, you and your friends. Well, for the first time since the threats began, Terry's feeling scared. He thought he would have figured this all out by now, but you know what? He's nowhere near to it. So deep within the bowels of Manhattan's back street, Al Simmons, the hell spawn, sits on a throne of waste and debris that was assembled by the homeless now under his protection. Even though he looks at it as filth at first, but you know what? A throne's a throne, bruh. Spawn is reading this file and he's like, oh god, no. Vito thinks I'm Terry? That is some crazy stuff. So in the meanwhile, Vito Gravano is being debriefed about the overkill program. And this is going back to issue number seven where Overkill was dismantled by Spawn. So the scientist debriefs Vito that modifications were made to his armor while combat damage to his exoskeleton is always possible. This will keep it minimal. So the same assaults used in the past, well, it'll be useless now. But there's one slight problem Vito's like, and what is that? It seems like we weren't able to completely wipe some of Overkill's memories. Vito Gravano's like, I don't care about that memory, man. I need him tonight. I need him to do the work. Phone my office as soon as he's ready. In the meantime, I need to check up on another one of my situations. And this is going back to the violator issue number two, which we did cover in this channel. That was a hell of a story too. But you know what? Vito Gravano's like, ah, you know what? Now I could kill two birds with one stone. First is violator, but now it's spawn. And guess what? He's going to be getting his invite tonight. 
So in this panel right here, Terry Fitzgerald is feeling hopeless. I mean, he rushes home to see if his family is okay. And he was wanting to forget all about the troubles and be with his wife and baby. But, you know, he hasn't been able to get on the phone with him. He's wondering, all concerned that maybe they didn't make it home. Maybe they're in trouble. He questions and questions start racing wildly in his brain. Paranoia is growing. And as a trained security operative, he expects better of himself. Now he looks out the window, he sees an unmarked car with two CIA officers. He spot them on the frantic drive home. And guess what? They parked right outside in his front door. It's obvious they want him to know that he's being toyed with. While Terry tries to come to grips with the situation, a dark sedan pulls up behind the CIA vehicle. This one belongs to the mobsters, Vito Gravano's leg breakers. The government boys take immediate notice and they know something's up. So they tell him to freeze and they get on the radio and call for backup. What the hell? It's the feds. Let him rip it. So they shoot away and blast off. So Terry does the next wise and rational thing. He bolts out from his office carrying his own high powered rifle. He has to end this madness. But you know, this is not the most rational thing because now they're blasting off at him. And because the feds are distracted, now the monsters blast at the feds and that ends their life. So finally, the gun falls silent. There's no more gunfire. Listen up, Fitzgerald says the monsters. I know you can hear us. We've got your wife and girl. If you want to see either of them again, You'll be in the alleyway between 5th and 6th at 27th at midnight, and you better be alone. They drive away. Little does Terry know that they were calling his bluff because all they see is they have a tail on Wanda and Cyan and her grandma, but they don't have them in custody. It's just a way to get Terry to, you know, act out of character. But as the sound of sirens draw closer and the neighbors start to peek through their curtains and see Terry standing over two dead bodies, Terry does the only thing he can think of, and that is to run. So hours later, this homeless guy tells Al, Al, he's coming, just like he said over on 6. And then Spawn's like, then the files were correct. The documents procured by Spawn from Vito Gravano's office mention Overkill's midnight appointment. And this guy tells him, Spawn, you better hurry, man, because some black dude in a suit is right in his sights. He don't stand a chance. So whatever you're doing, please be careful. This is serious. Thanks for the warning, says Spawn. I've got a little help tucked away. Terry goes to the dumpster and meets up exactly where he was told to meet up at 5th and 6th on 26th block or whatever. Overkill shows up and Terry just knows he's in deep trouble. Nice to see you again, hero. Terry, what the heck? So, so yeah, they think Terry is Spawn and all Terry can do is Wanda, Cyan, I love you because he knows he's about to meet his end. And he has to say that in a soft whisper because, you know, he can't get all aggressive. Like, all the fear, all the testosterone is just sucked out of him. So Spawn is frantically looking for him. His weapons and it's those two steel piercing AKT 20 XI portable cannons that he threw away that he disposed of in the air from their last bout with the overkill and that's back in issue number seven so now that spawns frantically looking for all this he realizes that each passing moment is keeping Terry in a potentially fatal position there's no time for delay on any level a gun gets pointed to his head don't move Great work, Twitch, says Sam. Thank you, sir. And Spawn's like, guys, I really don't need this right now. I ain't got time for this. Time, once again, it becomes an enemy to Spawn and to his friend. And that's how Spawn became trapped in the alley of death because of a file that changed everything. What you guys think of the video, comment below, let me know. And also link in the description if you wish to add this comic book and or some of our other rated comics exclusives to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. We start off the issue with an overview of Jason Wynn, Spawn, Vito Gravano, Wanda Blake, Sam Burke, and Twitch Williams. They are all major players in an increasingly twisted game of cat and mouse. Each is somehow connected to the strange existence of Spawn, who was brought back to life in issue number one, stripped of his identity, charged with tremendous but exhaustible power. He was awakened five years after his time to find his wife remarried. These were all realities awaiting for a man who was in love. A prisoner of his new life on Earth, Spawn's actions have triggered several manhunts by very influential people. None is prepared for what truth may emerge from their investigation. And what's unfolding is that an innocent man, Terry Fitzgerald, is a prime subject. Though through strange circumstances, he has become the target of numerous groups, CIA, FBI, police, and the mafia, all have determined that he is the root of their problems. 
each has its own special way of dealing with such annoyances. And one of that special way, it's Overkill. As Overkill is telling Terry Fitzgerald, get on your feet. Don't care like some dog now. You want to be a hero, then act like it. I came here to destroy the man. And this is going back to issue number six and seven of Spawn when they first battled out. But this time, since Overkill's reconstruction, Overkill has been programmed to believe that he now faces Spawn, who nearly destroyed him a few weeks ago. So this guy, this homeless guy, wakes up, runs away, and it's happening just like he said, and he has to run and alert Al of this. Now, not too far away, speaking of trying to alert Al, Sam tells Spawn, I don't care what your hair is, bud, it's time for us. You have to have a little chat about the little situation that's going on. And Spawn's like, I'm not about to move for you at all, because I'm leaving here with or without your permission. You can either follow me and help me, or get out my way before I hurt you. The choice is yours. I've got a friend who's in desperate need of my help right now against a cyborg mafia hitman because of false information from the CIA and FBI officials. So even the police have managed to screw this up. So I can't find my weapons because Spawn needs some big guns to do with overkill. And since he can't find them, he has to go in with his hand. Hands. and unfortunately spawn does have some hands but his hands is not going to be enough for overkill sam is wondering if he should believe this story but but sam concludes he ain't believing nothing so spawns like go screw yourself fat man i said you're welcome to join me but i guarantee that those that this robot is not going to feel those pea shooters you're packing that's why i was looking for my cannons so as this homeless guy from before alerts spawn ow ow it's happening you gotta come this guy is as big as a house shine and new but the pounding he's pounding with this guy this guy ain't lifting a finger I think he's dead spawn bolts cursing himself for the delay as a government assassin he was trained to stay focused it's obvious he's losing his edge so Sam tells twitch to stop him and twitch is a hell of a marksman so he shoots his shot and he shoots the gun tearing through a cartilage and shattering a kneecap it's the that's the fastest way to disable anyone but spawn never breaks his stride as he disappears into the alleyway and sam's like i thought you hit him and twitch is like i did now shocked with this reality they decide to go after spawn who's fleeing away and this thing is just going nuts right now now before we get into this action right here in this panel right here wanda blake is having a conversation with granny now what comes from this conversation besides just a visit of family granny tells Wanda that Al came to visit her he's an angel now he seemed a bit troubled though but he asked about you and he said he still loves you granny how can Al come visit you so now we get to establish that Wanda Blake knows that Spawn or Al Simmons is still alive and he still loves her but now this is where the scene has to jump into some action she gets a phone call and the phone calls from Connie and Connie tells Wanda you need to get home two men have been killed on your lawn the police said Terry killed him now, also, Terry did not kill those men. It was Jason's Wynn men that killed the Mafia, or the Mafia killed the federal agents. And now Jason Wynn knows that he's into some shit right now. And he clutches his teeth because political pressure from the White House is unrelenting. Wynn must bring this case to a close. He will stick the case to his patsy, Terry Fitzgerald, because even though Spawn took those weapons from the warehouse, Jason wants to pin it on Terry. So any misstep at this stage will end Jason Wynn's career. He is keenly aware of that. The witch hunt will continue. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Fitzgerald was not behind the security breaches, which embarrasses Wynn, and Wynn knows it. Now his ugly tactics have backfired, and the two FBI agents are dead. Wynn weighs his choices, his options very coldly. So he tells his Patsy, or he tells his henchmen, get to the neighbors now. So across town, Vito Gravano is obviously pissed. He was like, you guys are some kind of stupid operators or what? Your plan was to get Fitzgerald to the rendezvous with Overkill. Not to kill two federal agents. I don't need that kind of heat. I got enough problems on my own already. You go back there and you make this all go away. I don't mean a little bit. I mean all of it. Capiche, capiche. Now go do your thing. Now, their initial plan was they hoped that Fitzgerald was dumb enough to rush right over for that little business meeting because they used the ploy that they had Wanda and Cyan, which they really didn't. They just had them in their sights, not had him in captivity. So now Terry's paying the price for it. And Overkill's just laying the work on him too. Like, fine, have it your way, hero, thinking Terry is spawn. You will not want to fight no more? Then I hope you don't mind if I just carry on in spite of you. And Overkill's about to just wedge him and slam him to the ground to the point where Terry is just Terry Fitzgerald putting onto the ground no crock pot needed 
Actually, I don't think you need a crock pot to make Terry Fitzgerald chunk, but you get my drift. Right before he lays a landing blow, the final landing blow, Spawn comes into the rescue. From dense shadows comes a crimson blur. He moves quick and deliberately, moving with specific intent. Spawn snatches Terry's battered body and touches down 20 feet away to get a safe distance out of there. So Spawn tells Terry to get out of here. I'll handle this. And Terry does leave. Overkill's like, fool, you're a dead man. So even though Terry is suffering through internal bleeding, cracked ribs, fractured jaw, none of these matter to Terry as he sprints for the streets. He belongs to the streets. Well, at this point, he does belong to the streets because he can't handle that smoke no more. He still believes Terry that the Mafia have his wife and child, so he has to get out of there. But you know what? He's not quick enough to outrun a bio laser stream from overkill and spawns like no now before spawn can move his cape does the moving to this point his costume had only come to life while protecting its host tonight it sends a further use so spawn grabs a two by four to hit overkill with and he knows it's not gonna cause any damage to him but at this point he's he just needs to cause a distraction to him and overkill's like finally my proper target without your gun you're nothing says spawn well, Overkill's about to show him what that nothing really meant because he's whipping Spawn's ass like it's nothing. So Sam and Twitch finally catch up to him and they see the lay down, the smackdown that Spawn is taking. So to them, that means crap. That means the rest of his story is probably true, which means that now there's a multi-agency manhunt going on. Just my freaking, like, this is the kind of stuff we need. We don't need that kind of stuff right now. We don't have that much time because we out here and we can't radio in because the car is way over there. So that leaves him with one option. And that option is to shoot first, forget the questions. They can ask the questions later because they need Spawn alive and they can't let Overkill pop Spawn's head like a zit. So Twitch shoots him, the bullets pounce off of him like peas. You know, they don't mean shit to him. So once Wanda Blake gets to the house, we're going to go back to this, but when Wanda Blake gets to the house, she's assaulted with 100 questions and 30 versions of the offense simultaneously from reporters. And she's like, no way did my Terry do all this. No freaking way. So spotting a handful of neighbors, she huddled them to ask him to tell them the truth, but they can't. They see nothing. So right now, one of the neighbors is illegal immigrants. Jason Wynn got to him first. Shut your mouth and I won't expose you. The other person, he lived a pretty mundane life, but he avoided income taxes for three years and he doesn't want that exposed. And the other lady, she had a child out of wedlock. And now that the baby daddy's in prison, he has a parole hearing in two months. She was promised that he'll be free. So the, everything just shuts down on Wanda. She cries and she's like, she never wanted to admit it to herself, but she always knew that this day would come. Being a widow to one government intelligence agent wasn't enough. She had to go marry another, and that was Terry. So she breaks down and cries, and she's trying to figure out if all the doors are closed, where do I go from here? Oh, well, this is where we're going to go from here. We're going to go to Overkill in that battle with Spawn and Terry. So Spawn is getting that work from Overkill. And Terry's like, I just can't leave him here. He saved my life. So with waves of pain shooting throughout his body, Terry manages to push an empty dumpster down the alleyway. He won't abandon the costume vigilantly, which each agonizing step, momentum is built. Just enough to topple a 1,200 pound cyborg that was already off balance. And when the dumpster hits him, Overkill's pissed. You idiot! You were waiting for your friend? Here he is, and he tosses Spawn into Terry's cracked ribs. And Sam tells Twitch, what are you doing, Twitch? Your gun's useless. Oh no, says Twitch, I got an idea. And Twitch is a hell of a marksman, but he needs an opening. So Overkill goes to work on Spawn, lands a blow. And Twitch is like, turn. Overkill lands another blow. And Twitch is like, come on, baby, turn. And Overkill's like, nah, let me lay this work on Spawn. And when he does turn, bingo, Terry knows he has an opening. So with uncanny accuracy, the bullet enter Overkill's body through a small opening in the ear cavity, interrupting the electric flow for a nanosecond. So Twitch had hoped to cause some systematic disruption, and he did, because now Overkill has a new mission in mind. He's calling out to the Young Blood, which is another comic series through Image Comics. So the result was completely unexpected. The cyborg lumbers off and has a new directive now. And Sam's like, what a bloody mess and what quite it is. So Spawn and Terry are laying on the ground, bloodied, 
but still alive but overkill did lay that work on him and that is the end of this issue of spawn issue number 23 where we unravel the conspiracy with everyone and this is a clash of the titans between spawn versus overkill what you guys think of the comic book comment below let me know also links in description if you wish to add this comic book and or some of our other rated comics exclusives to add to your comic book collection support the art support the industry so we begin this issue with the narrative of Sam Burke and Twitch. It's been a very strange night for Detective Sam Burke and Twitch. While hunting Spawn, who's responsible for temporarily getting Sam and Twitch suspended from the police force, they found themselves in the bigger of a much bigger scenario. So they later caught up with Spawn and Terry Fitzgerald, but they don't know that that's Terry Fitzgerald at the time after their battle with Overkill in the previous issue. So Sam Burke stares down at the two and he's just looking at him like, man, this is going to be some paperwork and it's going to kill me. But you know what? It's obvious that he'll soon catch on to the entire situation. So kneeling over Spawn's limp form, Twitch checks out for any signs of life. It'll be a shame to have to come this far and end up with no answers tonight. So the search has become way too personal to go unresolved. So Twitch decides maybe I'll try some CPR. So as the mask is drawn back revealing what's left of the man called Al Simmons, he's like, man, yo, that is one fogly mofo. I ain't giving that boy no CPR. Nada. So they also wonder naturally what the hell happened to him. So they can tell that his face has been burnt off. And maybe what he's been telling them the previous issue, maybe hold some truth, maybe hold some merit. But Terry Fitzgerald rolls over. The detectives assume that he's a businessman. And in fact, he works as a linguist for the CIA, but they don't know that. So the detectives have been so engrossed with Spawn, they momentarily forget about Terry Fitzgerald. But remember, they don't know that he's Terry Fitzgerald or that he's with the CIA. So Sam is like, all right, buddy, listen up. I got about 200 questions I need answered. Like, what's going on here? Let's start with number one. So after a few minutes, a patrol car happens to be upon the scene. So Sam then radios in to the nearest precinct. So he tells him everything they have on Fitzgerald. They tell him that he's with the CIA, but they ain't got no wallet to prove it. So they hang up the phone. The boys in the precinct are like, all right, a couple detectives from downtown, they say they got Fitzgerald, that guy we've all been looking for, but they don't seem to know anything about him murdering the feds. That's in the previous couple issues. So they want to get all the units down there and take over the scene and nail that traitor and put an end to him. So meanwhile, at Jason Wynn's office at the Omni Intelligence Agency, the United States Security Group, Jason Wynn tells his group that they found Fitzgerald down near Penn Station and I want our people down there now. Once they're there, Pull rank, he's ours, that ass is mine. This time, I'ma fry that son of a bitch. Make sure that the area is so tight that the wind can't even get out. Eliminate the problem. So he knows, Jason Wynn knows that Fitzgerald is no traitor, but circumstances made him the logical suspect because, you know, Jason Wynn has some answer to do, and that was answered the previous issues where weapons were missing, and now Jason Wynn needs to fall out, and also Jason Wynn's disappearances as the Redeemer, but hey, like I said, that's previous issues right there. So rather than Jason Wynn admit his error, Wynn continues to conduct a brutal investigation. Police, FBI, all are called into the play. So Wynn's callousness is a byproduct of the years of unquestioned authority. So as a supreme director of U.S. intelligence agencies, he has single-handedly ended wars, even began some. So Terry Fitzgerald is only one man. His life means nothing to a dictator whose effectiveness is being questioned. A quick resolution to all this fiasco will restore his preeminence and his dominance in the global community and in the White House, but that would leave something else in the aftermath, Wanda and their daughter Cyan, Terry's daughter. So Wanda Blake, wife of a man, Terry Fitzgerald, who was now accused also murdering two FBI agents, tears falls down as she prays that this is just some demented nightmare. But no, it is very real. The life that she and Terry had built has crashed down around her. As Wanda now holds tight their daughter Cyan, she works to push past the shock and focus on what's in her heart, hope and love. She prays to God that this will all be over with soon because, I mean, what else can she do at this point? So there's agents posted outside of their house 
maybe to protect her but no there i doubt they're very i seriously doubt they're gonna protect her but you know what remember in the previous issues the mob told terry that meet him in the alley because we're we got your wife and kids but that was all a bluff so now back to terry fitzgerald and sam burke and terry wakes up and tells him how many times i have to tell you i don't know where that freaking robot went he doesn't recall any of it your guess is as good as mine i was just trying to stay alive like that song huh 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 staying alive anyways okay that was kind of cheesy but terry tells him he was expecting to be meeting the couple mafia punks over here yeah 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 says sam let's see if i got this straight you're a g-man who's expecting a meeting with a mob they sucker you here send you their 10 ton cyber hitman instead and uh, something doesn't add up over here you know this is a bull jive so now we got a dead here over here and we don't know who he is but he seems to have a personal reason to try to save your ass. All this comes as a complete surprise to you. On top of all this, you claim you have lost your identification with the CIA. I don't know, Twitch. What do you think? Because Sam finds this awfully suspicious. But Twitch is like, I don't know. There seems to be some merit to what he's saying, sir. So these bums right here, they line up outside. They're like, oh, man, this is real bad. We got to get some help over here. So all this, even the homeless are filling in on this and they're trying to help out. And they're all drawn into the web of activity surrounding Spawn because Spawn acted without thought or consequences. Because this all started with the dead child pedophile, Billy Kincaid, a few stolen guns, and a couple of missing files. These events form an obvious pattern here, but they're all trying to figure it all out. So faced with odd situations, Spawn did what he had to do. Unfortunately for the fallout from his actions, this has landed squarely on his shoulders and his best friend of a lifetime ago, and they're all trying to figure it out. Sam tells Terry, you should settle down here, buddy. The cops will be here soon. Terry is like, you guys have to believe me. I don't have time. The mafia's got my wife and kid. I got to get out of here. Hey, listen here, buddy. I don't care what your problem is. You ain't going nowhere, says Sam. Back off, Twitch. I got this. You know, Sam's pride is kicking in. And Terry, acting like a very desperate man, is like, are you deaf? Didn't you hear what I said? It's the mob, you idiot. They'll kill them. Oh, no. So he gets away. Twitch tells him to freeze. They got my wife and kid. You got to shoot me down, bro. And Sam is like, oh, man. He senses that Wanda's in danger, but he doesn't know that it's a bluff. So back in the office of New York Mafia, Vito Gravano, tensions are running high. Though he lived through this ordeal before, and because this took place after the Violator issue, which we did cover, things are not all satisfactory to him. And now the heat's been churned up. Two of his boys, taken by surprise, shot and killed a pair of federal agents on the front lawn of Terry Fitzgerald's house. So they're all in this entanglement kind of speak. So Vito tells his henchmen, I sent Frankie and Tommy back to the murder scene. They're making sure we get all this cleaned up. Make sure Overkill did his job. I need Fitzgerald dead. The cartel has been. And before you can finish the sentence, ring. The phone rings. Vito picks up the phone. Yeah, this is Gina. We just called a meeting for next Thursday. Some of the members have requested a progress report. There's been unhappiness with your recent dealings. you got six days to correct this. You understand? We're counting on you, Vito. And Gravano is not used to being on the receiving end of threats, nor will he allow it to continue. He's pissed, and he tells his men, send someone over to Gino's restaurant. Take his top chef and slice his hand off. Gino needs to understand who runs this show. In the meantime, I want Fitzgerald's body. Tell Overkill to leave enough of it intact for me to take it to my meeting on Thursday. That should shut him up. But unfortunately for Gravano, this may not be as easy as it seems because right now Fitzgerald is a very hot commodity. The police believe he's in possession of a stolen experimental firearms. The FBI suspect him of killing two of their agents, even though it was the mob, but they suspect him of doing that. The CIA is prodding all over this, and, and that's at Wynn's request. So Jason Wynn is kind of like, we're going to blame, you know, Terry Fitzgerald for all this. Meanwhile, the FBI and the mob are all up in the mix, too. So it's all messed up, and it's all messy, and it's nasty. In this panel right here, Terry Fitzgerald is running away from Sam, and Sam is not in the best cardio shape, but his part partner Twitch is. Twitch intercepts him from the corner, gunpoint tells him it's over with, and Terry slumps to the ground. A broken man putting his head in his hands. He begins to sob. He doesn't know why any of this is happening. Things are so out of whack. But even more importantly, he has failed his wife and child. That is more than a man can bear. 
And Sam tells him, I'm getting sick and tired of this. We're going back to your dead hero, buddy. I'll bring the local cops up and bring them up to date, but we're going to get to the bottom of this, all right? So an empty can gets thrown at Sam's head. Get out of here, you bum. This is our alley. So they stand poised and ready to take control, ready to defend their fallen King Spawn. I wonder if that's a foreshadow of the King Spawn series, but anyways. So cans, bottles, wood, whatever, they pelt the two detectives relentlessly. Terry sees another opportunity to flee, but as he flees, distance from the police, he's spotted by the first group on the scene, the CIA. And guess what? The proverbial pedal to the metal is put to the test. Terry turns to run, but it's too late. He stands frozen, staring at the headlights like a wild animal on the highway. He is stuck. He knows his luck has finally ran out. The pair didn't know what hit him at first. They hit something at 67 miles an hour. Why not just make it 69? So the engine rammed into the passengers, shattering their legs. The car will look like as if it impacted a steel pole, but for all intents and purposes, it kind of did. And that pole was Al Simmons. Al Simmons employs powers derived from the pits of hell. Once in a while, he's glad to use it. He knew that increasing his density was gonna drain some irreplaceable energy, but he gladly and willingly did it to save his friend's life. So as the horde converges upon him, Spawn stands and stares. His CIA background informs his decision, when to react and how. He has several targets tonight and one purpose. Until now, he tried hiding himself from the public. And that hasn't worked very well because guess what? People have been getting to some shit because of it. So he needs a new tactic. And that tactic is fear. It could be brought out in many ways. Irrational thought, paranoia, superstition. It could also be brought out by example. And that example is he paints the wall with his necroplasm. These alleys belong to spawn. That's the boogeyman. And he really does exist. That's what the people think. Fear is running high. So with various files taken from Tony Twist's office, Spawn had begun to piece together each new agency dropping into the mix and how they were targeted in the crossfires. So first he visits Jason Wynn and he tells Jason, well, call off your dogs. Fitzgerald is mine. Back everyone up. I want Terry Fitzgerald to be so squeaky clean They'll want to give him a medal for all this stuff. In the future, you and your people will stay away from him and his family. And if you don't listen to me, I know what makes you tick, Jason. And Jason's like, what the? How'd you know my name? Hey, you know what? This, what's in this file can really mess up your career politically and for the rest of your life. So stay the F away. And Jason looks in the file and he scans it. And some of the items containing it, no one else can possibly know. So Jason is going to listen. Now Spawn visits Sam in 4 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the night and tells Sam, hey, I got this file on Chief Banks and he needs to back up off of Terry. Tell him to drop the Fitzgerald case. So give this file to Chief Banks. I hate to see what the media would make of this, of his extracurricular activities. And if he's smart, I won't have to distribute copies. So Sam, he got the message. Now it's time for Vito. Vito Gravano sits sweating in his private sauna. He finds it therapeutic, you know, because it's a sauna. Now Spawn tells Vito Gravano to cease and desist, all right? And I got this file right here. Unless you want the crops crawling up your ass, you'll leave Fitzgerald alone. And in this file, Spawn says the file has everything that lays out your organization's objectives for the next six months. So yeah, the cops will be busy all up in that ass if you don't back up off of Terry's ass, all right? And also stay the hell out of my alleyways. Well, Vito has to oblige. So at the home of Terry Fitzgerald and his wife, Wanda Blake, the effects of the Spawn's cryptic visits are discussed in hushed tones and terry's like i just don't get it the entire city was chasing me down trying to nail me and then all of a sudden in the middle of their interrogation someone whispers something in the ear and now i'm a non-issue and wanda's like honey i'm not gonna pretend i know what this is all about it scared me i was scared that i was gonna lose you and raise a child on my own i can't bear that and terry's like i was scared too sweetheart and i still am Someone mess with our lives, then just like that, it's called off. It takes an awful lot of influence to do something like that. And that's what truly scares me. And guess what? Little does he know he's got Spawn out there just pulling the strings and looking, th looking over things. So he stares into the light from, you know, looking into his best friend's house and his wife's house, even though Terry married his wife and now that Spawn's house. Hey, you know what? That's just the end of the issue as Spawn overlooks and sees everything and he'll worry about everything else as it comes up. 
up. But you know what? There's new stories, new battles, and new devils, and new asses to kick. And that is the end of this issue of Spawn. Issue number 24, Spawn's Flaming Sign of Terror and Spawn's Message to Everyone and the End of the Hunt story arc. What you guys think of this comic book? Comment below. Let me know. Yeah, you know we got to go old school on this because oldies are still goodies, all right? So we begin this issue with these bums, you know, in the Bowery of New York City, arguing about the Brooklyn Dodgers or how the Brooklyn Dodgers are no longer the Brooklyn Dodgers. They went to Los Angeles and they're pissed about it. So they're drinking, arguing over this, and this guy named Paul gets up to go to the bathroom because, you know, you got to break the seal. So all is right in the alleys again. No police harassment, no FBI running around like hyperactive children. No one from the outside is bothering them. They're just having a good time. And this is referencing the previous issues of Spawn where all this mafia, gang, police wars were going on and all this other stuff. It's just the last couple issues and it concluded in the last issue. But then this happens. Some guy goes up to Paul and tells him with his old rusty blade out the corner of his eye. This guy notices it. He tells him, we've been hearing about your hotshot, your Spawny guy. So me and the boys would like to share something. He decks him in the face. We don't need his help. Our boss can take care of him himself big time so tell your little hero that if it's a turf war he's looking for then he's pushing the wrong guys all right tell him to move back 15 blocks and if you don't it's gonna get bloody so elsewhere you know terry fitzgerald's back in the office and he might be rushing back into things but he needs to distract himself you know he hasn't completely healed nor his cracked ribs has healed as well as a matter of fact almost any move he makes hurts him but he thought work would be good therapy for him. So he thinks to himself, admit it, Terry, things are wrong. Everyone's acting like nothing happened. No murders, no manhunts, no cops, nothing. And all this before Terry was getting all this heat from the CIA, the FBI, the mafia, just all the one day and agencies he's never heard of were coming at him. But now like nothing, they just stopped. And he knows something at play is very big here, but he needs to know what happened, but he has to be really cautious about it. So then all of a sudden, off panel hey there good looking you need some help it's wanda to show her moral support so wanda tells terry look i know i wanted to distance myself after what happened to al which is her former husband and i guess i was hoping that my ignorance would protect me from another heartache al's death tore me apart but you helped me through that all right so i'd like to help you Please, I know you're going through a lot. There are questions I've got about what just happened. i like to see if we can answer them, a few of them together. So Terry's like, okay, I, I, you got my support, baby. I love you. And she's like, I know you do. So this guy, David, the one who harassed the bum earlier, kicks in these boards, goes into this abandoned building and tells the boss, are you there? There you are. I proceeded into sector 12 like you said. Just like you said, Tremor, I also made threats and slapped them around a bit. They seem loyal to their commander and obviously Spawn has given them a false sense of security. So that's my report. What do you think? And Tremor's like, you've done well, David. A few more pieces to the puzzle and I'll have what I need. Then he has this outburst of anger. Then I'll be able to bring that fat pig Gravano down to his knees. I've waited long enough. Soon, very soon, I'm going to nail that mafia scumbag. And even David's like, yo, boss, he having too much burst right now. Chill out, man. You got to have some chill. All this building's crashing down. But Tremor emerges from the rubber. He doesn't care. Overkill, spawn, not God. So Tremor's like, nothing's going to save Vito told the boys that after they clear spawn and his gang off my turf i want a meeting with their so-called hero because he has something i need and i gots to have it and i wants it so now we go look at spawn even though he's accepted him being called spawn out of necessity all he wanted to do was to see his wife to return to his true love that was back in spawn issue number one when he died he accepted the deal with malboja instead he's been hunted a dead man from hell does not go unnoticed so instead of recapturing his past life he's merely avoiding it he doesn't want to be a mercenary no more or a mercenary in the afterlife but you know what that's backfired because he brought undue harm to his wife through his own careless actions rather than being protected she was almost killed he won't allow that again and this is referencing previously in spawn i mean if you watch this channel you know what i'm talking about but if you're just tuning in for the first time by all means feel free to check out the playlist at the end of this video we got you covered so now spawn vows to refocus to sort out this abominable excuse for her life but as a messiah now you know at least to the homeless to the people he's become a beacon of hope in their darkest hours ow you gotta hear this no i don't says spawn it's time you learn to solve your own problems no but you don't understand says 
the homeless guy. No, you don't understand, says Pawn. You people have become lazy, always turning to me for help. Well, I don't have all the answers. I can't solve all your problems. I got my own problems, all right? Dear God, Al, we didn't ask for this. They want you, not us. Well, tell whoever it is, I'm not interested. So engulfed by the darkness, Spawn leaves behind an innocent, soon to be candidate for the crossfire. Now in this panel right here, Sam and Twitch are just munching away at a diner and eating away at this deli sandwich It looks pretty good. And Twitch is like, I wonder what makes you so festive, right? And he becomes sarcastic. It must be that we have no solid leads in our search for Spawn. Am I getting warm, sir? And Sam's like, <laughs> I love your sarcasm, Twitch. But no, no, nah, it's not that. It's I got this file. And it's a file that contains all the info on that bugger Chief Banks that'll cripple him. And that brings a warm spot to my little heart. Alright, and that was a file that Spawn gave him in the previous issue. So the air begins to thicken as the early morning hours pass away. Spawn comes over here to rest and think. In his former life, he fought and killed for what he believed in, but that was another Al Simmons, he tells himself. Now it's different. He stares down at the scattered groups of homeless people. He knows that his moment of feeling human had become more and become also rare because he's not feeling this way he's not used to feeling this way so he must seize those moments defend his beliefs and act like a man stand against those who would oppose him and if it's a turf war plain and simple well it's time that he marked this territory he goes up to where tremor is sitting you want to talk not exactly says tremor he goes to the window grabs spawn and he's like what the hell plywood ah show yourself you coward here i am demon you won't have to push the old guys around anymore. And Tremor's like, idiot, I don't care about your people or mine. It's you that I want. Tell me what you know about Vito G and why he's after you so bad. That man doesn't get personally involved with anyone unless they know some things they shouldn't. And Spawn's like, what the hell does that have to do with the alleyways? You want to fight? I'm going to give you a fight. Then fight. Just leave my people alone. Dex him in the face wrap some chains around him and those chains are protecting their master so they snap and snar the beast now spawn uses military skills to gain the advantage because there should be no way and no reason for him to deplete his own powers because as established earlier if he depletes his power meter to zero that's his second death right there do you hear me stay away says spawn next time your head comes with me all right how dare you like tremors like you just gonna release me and flex on me you ain't gonna do all that so Spawn assumed the beast wouldn't back down. He planted himself in front of a weakened part of the floor, concealing the cracks with his cape, which is a deaf move, but the creature is swallowed by the collapsing planks. And you know, for the moment, the scene goes quiet, but for scurrying rats and the flapping of the crimson cloth, it seems as if this dispute has been settled. But no, this come up through the cracked floors, a biomechanical appendage extended twofold retracts in a blink. And this tremor guy is like, you listen good, damn it. I'm going to nail that pig veto and you're going to help me. And Spawn's like, what the hell is all this about? Is this like some personal vendetta? I don't care. You want Gravano? Fine. But what's this got to do with the turf war? And Tremor tells him it was merely a distraction. And he tells him about his history, he goes into his history. It wasn't long ago that Vito forced her to be his guinea pig. He wanted the perfect hitman. I was stupid enough to be employed by him at the time. But threats to my family were not made casually. And to protect him, I agreed to their high-tech butchery. They wanted to fuse flesh and metal, but someone screwed up. The combination of chemical microsurgery, who knows what sort of radiation, anti-drug rejection, or whatever transformed me, but a few days later, I escaped my imprisonment. And Spawn, he understands. He can reason with the guy. He feels for the guy. And he tells him. And Tremor's like, no, you can't. You see, he killed him. He slaughtered my whole family just to protect his own ass. And Spawn hears the rest of the grisly details, and it's all pain and anguish. It's something that he's quite familiar with. And Spawn tells him, I can help you, just give me an hour. And Tremor's like, and why should I? And Spawn tells him, because like me, you don't have a choice. So shortly, Spawn goes back and sneaks back on him, and he asks him, how'd you sneak up on me without making a sound? And Spawn tells him, it doesn't matter, but this might. It contains everything I have on Vito. I haven't read it all, but there's plenty in here to bust his balls. Where did it come from, says Tremor, his accountant. And that's going back to Spawn issue number 22. Thanks, Spawn. I'll give you a lowdown when I'm through with him. And Spawn's like, I'll be around. But Spawn pauses to think. For all his power, this creature seemed as tortured as Spawn himself and seems as willing to go to any lengths to achieve his goals. 
And so Spawn asked himself, is Tremor a friend or a foe or something in between? We will hopefully find that out later on as we establish more Spawn storyline with the oldies but goodies. But yeah, I'm going back old school here. What you guys think of the comic book? Comment below, let me know. Also, link in description if you wish to add this comic book through Amazon. It's an affiliate link, so your boy will get a small commission if you decide to buy through that affiliate link or anything on Amazon using that affiliate link. But if you also like to add some really cool rated comic limited print exclusives to your comic book collection, go ahead and check out ratedcomics.com to do that as well. Support the art, support the industry. Lastly, this review is sponsored by coffee. So if you'd like to buy a boy a cup of coffee, donate to the super things or link in description. But the greatest compliment you guys can do is by liking this video and subscribing to Rated Comics YouTube channel. Thank you again for watching. Until next time.